Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will be starting the event in a few moments. If you can kindly take your seats. Thank you.
you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be starting the event very soon. Uh, so kindly take your seats. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our invitees and attendees, both present in person as well as attending virtually. I am Niruthika Rivasam from ADB, and I will be your MC for this program. The Serendipity Knowledge Program, also known as COP, is an ADB initiative designed with the vision of becoming a knowledge solutions bank to Sri Lanka by creating a platform to share knowledge on issues relevant to the nation and facilitate discussion among stakeholders. With this edition of the SCOP event, we discuss opportunities and challenges for the ambitious SOE reforms agenda that Sri Lanka has embarked upon since the economic crisis of 2022. Today's event brings together world-renowned experts on SOE reforms who will share global lessons on navigating SOE reforms establishment of SOE holding company, and also focus on the Sri Lankan government's approach on SOE reform in the context of the current crisis. 
As I mentioned, this is a hybrid event that will be attended by both in-person participants as well as virtual participants. In the interest of time, we have set up a digital uh, form where you can post your questions uh, for the Q&A sessions. For in-person participants, there's a QR code on your table that will enable you to access your form. And for virtual participants, we will be posting a link on the chat that will enable you to submit your questions uh, through that link. So without further ado, to kickstart today's event, uh, I, I will call upon, on, um, I will call upon uh, Mr. Kenichi Yokoyama, Director General of South Asia Department of ADB, to present the welcome remarks. Uh, good morning. I hope I can hear uh, be heard. So uh, good morning, uh, Secretary to the Treasury, Director General Department of National Planning, Chairperson SOE Restructuring Unit, esteemed panelists, distinguished guests, and colleagues. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all, of, all to this seventh edition of Serendipity Knowledge Program, or SKOP. ADB, in close uh, coordination with the National Planning Department, Ministry of Finance, initiated SKOP in 2021. Uh, to respond to the knowledge demands of the country. SCOPE is the main vehicle for ADB to help the country in finding knowledge solutions. We also welcome our development partners uh, to join us in subjects of mutual interests. Today's event is quite timely, we believe, as we will be discussing state-owned enterprise reform, which is on top of the government's reform agenda. ADB has continued to work on critical development agendas uh, with the government, and I'm happy that our knowledge work, like our lending and advisory assistance, also continues across different themes. I'm pleased to see so many of you present today in Colombo, and many more joining this event virtually. In line with the recently approved IMF Extended Fund Facility, or EFF program, the government of Sri Lanka has embarked on an ambitious reform agenda. ADB looks forward to working together with the government of Sri Lanka and development partners on various sectoral reforms. After the IMF's uh, EFF approval, we approved to 350 million US dollar special policy based loan for the economic stabilization. ADB has in the pipeline other policy-based lending operations in key sectors, such as finance, energy, water, tourism, trade and competitiveness, and climate change. These policy-based loans will be underpinned by critical sector reforms, including institutional reforms of relevant SOEs where applicable. We are also discussing providing transaction advisory services to help the government divest its stakes in certain SOEs. As we all know, uh, SOEs have played an important role in Sri Lanka's socioeconomic development over the past decades. Currently, there are over 400 SOEs operating in several uh, key sectors, including power, finance and insurance, aviation, transport, water, health and education, among others. However, due to lack of proper governance and poor financial performance, many SOEs have become a burden to the treasury and to the banking sector, uh, which have highlighted the need for SOE reform. Following the 2022 interim budget, the government has already established the SOE restructuring unit to lead this reform. To further mainstream its reform, relevant legal and legislative framework for SOEs need to be developed. In this context, uh, we will hear from Secretary to the Treasury, Mr. Mahindra Siriwardana, on the government Sri Lanka's approach to the SOE reforms. This follows my uh, welcome note. Lessons and experience from other countries show that prudent SOE reform have led to increased efficiencies, improved service delivery, and better outcomes for the economy in terms of resource allocation and productivity. Commercial orientation and governance structure 
that bring about greater transparency and accountability can maximize the value of an organization. To introduce this commercial orientation and better governance, many countries have established an SOE holding company to ensure professional oversight of SOEs. This is also being considered by the government of Sri Lanka. So we look forward to hearing from Mr. Doug Data, who is renowned expert on SOE reform, including establishment of an SOE holding company in Sweden. The ensuing panel discussion with a diverse set of experts representing the government, TAMASEC and ADB, then gives an opportunity to discuss challenges and opportunities of SOE reform in Sri Lanka. As many of you may be aware, SOE reforms had a checkered history in many countries, including Sri Lanka. And this session will delve more into those challenges as well as opportunities and how Sri Lanka could get it in the right direction. I believe today's uh, discussions will be an excellent opportunity to understand and learn on the other countries' experience of SOE reforms when navigating through Sri Lanka's SOE reform process. So I wish you all the very best and look forward to engaging with you again in the next edition of SKOP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yokoyama, for that informative address and uh, particularly setting the stage for today's proceedings. Next up, I invite on stage Mr. K. M. Mahinda Sirivardhana, Secretary to the Treasury, to inform the gathering on Sri Lanka's approach to SOE reforms. Mr. Kenshi Yokohama, uh, Director General South Asia Department of ADB, who is joining virtually with us. Mr. Takafumi Kadono, Country Director, ADB Sri Lanka Mission. Esteemed resource persons, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen who are in person and who are joining virtually. Very good morning to all of you. And I'm very thankful to you for inviting me to take part in this uh, serendipity knowledge program on state-owned enterprises reform, challenges and opportunities for Sri Lanka. I have been interested with giving some points on Sri Lanka's approach to state-owned enterprise reforms. As a background, I would like to go to last year situation. In fact, the state-owned enterprises sector is being discussed at a time that Sri Lanka is experiencing its, its worst economic crisis in the post-independent history, which led to serious and far-reaching social and political ramifications. The government has responded to the crisis by taking a series of measures to stabilize the economy and gradually bring back economic growth in a much more sustainable manner going forward while implementing long delayed structural reforms. Having surpassed an extremely challenging period of turbulence in 2022, the Sri Lankan economy is gradually showing signs of stability on many economic fronts, supported by these reform measures, with initial indications of moving out of recession towards recovery and eventually growth. However, there is no room for complacency and no margin for error to deviate from the envisaged reform path by reverting to unsustainable policies and practices of the past. Given the nascent recovery and prevailing vulnerabilities, it is emphasized that the consequences of such a shift would be devastating. As in many developing and emerging market countries, Sri Lanka's SOEs have contributed to the government's fiscal and national debt crisis, 
which led to call for SOE reform and debt restructuring. Hence, tackling the increased vulnerabilities and low efficiency of SOEs is crucial to Sri Lanka's transitioning towards a more sustainable growth path. SOEs in Sri Lanka have had a mixed record in their contribution to the Sri Lankan economy from the time of their establishment for various reasons. While some sectors such as state-owned banks make an important contribution to financial inclusion, several SOEs in sectors such as energy and transport have faced persistent losses with significant fiscal implications. The presence of SOEs in Sri Lanka is very significant and encompasses a broad range of economic sectors, supply of key utilities, and employment of a large number of individuals. SOEs are vulnerable to mismanagement and corruption as well as because of potential conflicts between the ownership and the policy-making functions of the government and undue political influence on their policies, appointments, and business practices. It is also observed that their internal control, monitoring, and governance frameworks are inadequate to deal with these problems. As indicated in the National Transformation Roadmap presented in June 2023, many of these enterprises have garnered monopolistic positions in the market, hindering private investment. Price fixing, inefficient management, and poor entrepreneurship have weakened public finances turning these institutions into national burdens that are dependent on the taxpayer. Therefore, the success or failure of SOEs has a significant impact on the economy as a whole. Hydro loss making SOEs such as Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, CPC, Ceylon Electricity Board, CEB, and Sri Lankan Airlines create significant fiscal issues since their losses need to be addressed through treasury transfers using taxpayer funds or public debt. Loss-making SOEs also create vulnerabilities in the banking system since the accumulated debt is often funded by state banks. There are also cross-liabilities between SOEs such as large liabilities incurred by Sri Lankan Airlines and Sri Lankan Industry Board to the CPC, creating a complex interaction between balance sheets of SOEs, the state banks, and the government. All of these challenges require comprehensive reforms which have been delayed for a prolonged period and have resulted in significant macroeconomic vulnerabilities. All of this, uh, as indicated in the interim budget speech in 2022, these difficult but necessary measures pertaining to SOEs will no doubt be challenging to uh, address, but failing to do so would create catastrophic risks, particularly for financial sector stability, and will entail even higher taxation burdens on the public in the future. Reforms in the SOEs in an essential and is, is an essential component in the ongoing reforms in the government revenue and expenditure front to ensure fiscal discipline and address critical fiscal and debt sustainabilities in the country. In designing a reform agenda for SOEs, successful case studies from our neighboring economies and rest of the world would be of virtual uh, importance, I think. This would be discussed in time to come in this seminar. Globally, countries have increasingly moved away from state-led enterprise development strategies to ones which encourage the private sector to engage in business, with government providing business-friendly policy and regulated frameworks without compromising the long-term interests of the public. In consideration of these domestic and global trends and developments, the government has commenced focusing on the following key reform areas on SOEs in recent times in Sri Lanka. Key reform number one, cost-reflective cost reflective pricing. The adverse impacts on the economy due to loss-making SOEs reached a crescendo in 2022. Energy sector SOEs, CPC, and CEB experienced the largest impact due to prolonged periods of product mispricing and weak financial management. As the currency depreciated from around 200 rupees to 365 rupees per US dollar, while global energy, global energy prices skyrocketed, the costs of fuel imports increased significantly, driving up costs for both entities. However, retail prices for fuel and electricity were not priced in a fully, fully, fully cost reflective manner. The first 
Key reform for the major loss making of SOIs was the introduction of cost reflective retail pricing of fuel and electricity. Electricity prices were increased in a cost reflective manner only in August 22 and February 23, for the first time since 2013. Petroleum products were priced in a cost reflective manner since May 2022. Due to the delayed implementation of cost reflective pricing, both CB around 262 billion and CPC around 650 billion ran up large losses in 2022. The Treasury had to step up, step in with increased fund transfers to both institutions to support these losses, which is unsustainable. While the interaction of cost reflective pricing is crucial, critical for a net energy importing country like Sri Lanka, it does not create challenges for consumers. It does create challenges for consumers, particularly the poor and vulnerable. The government will use direct cash transfers to provide relief to those objectively identified as poor and vulnerable instead of underpricing utilities such as fuel and electricity as a tool to provide welfare. This approach would also aid in preventing inefficient energy use by more affluent consumers. Key reform two, balance sheet restructuring. Cost reflective pricing alone was not sufficient to fully address the losses of these entities. CPC, for instance, had large volumes of foreign currency denominated debt on its balance sheet, even though its revenue is almost entirely in rupees. This mismatch leads to large losses arising whenever the currency depreciates. In order to address this, the government took on to its balance sheet the foreign currency denominated loans guaranteed by the sovereign on the balance sheet of CPC and most of the same of CEB. This was a part of a larger exercise of restructuring balance sheets in fiscally significant SOEs, namely CPC, CEB, Sri Lankan Airlines and Road Development Authority, RDA. During this process, the government also addressed several cross liabilities among SOEs. For instance, due to delays in settlement of fuel supplies, both the CEB and Sri Lankan Airlines have run up large liabilities with CPC, which in turn have been funded by state banks at high cost. The cabinet of ministers approved a strategy to unwind these cross liabilities, which will be executed in the near term. Following this overall balance sheet restructuring exercise, the financial positions of all of these major SOEs will be significantly cleaned up, reducing the risks emanating to the fiscal sector and to the banking sector. However, a long-term solution that would present any future buildup of similar balance sheet mismatches would be essential. Key reform three, introduction of competitive, competition in key sectors. As the financial position of CEB and CPC stabilize, the next requirement is to drive productivity and competitiveness in these entities by, entities by introducing greater competition. Measures have already been taken to introduce competition to the downstream petroleum retail market. The first new player, Sinopec, commenced the commercial operations last week. Once there is greater competition in the market, it will force CPC to streamline its operations, reduce cost structures, and drive efficiency in order to remain a re relevant player in the petroleum retail space. The outcome would be better pricing and ser services for consumers. Globally, petroleum retail space is a competitive business with multiple players with governments taking a backstage. At the same time, the government also has initiated measures to unbundle operations at the CEB where ADB is also playing a key role. This will lead to greater operational and financial independence of electricity generation and distribution activities, enabling competition within the entity improved transparency through bulk supply transaction accounts will allow for greater price discovery and overall better outcomes for consumers as a whole. As another example, the automation of obsolete practices such as manual reading of meters would benefit consumers through more predictable and timely readings while improving productivity of the workforce. Key reform number four, divestment of non-strategic assets. Through SOEs, the government is engaged in commercial activity in a number of spheres. Other than in certain activities such as natural monopolies, sectors with uh, material security uh, or strategic implications, there's limited justification for state engagement in commercial activity. This becomes all the more applicable in situations where fiscal constraints are very significant. In countries like India, even sec sectors with strategic implications, including airlines and ports, Successful divestments have been observed 
with positive fiscal implications. As said before, the role of the government is primarily in ensuring a stable macroeconomic environment, rule of law, and regulatory framework in which commercial enterprise can take place in an efficient and equitable manner. Towards this end, the government has commenced the process of gradually divesting state-owned assets in commercial activities which do not fit the above criteria. In some cases, this includes entities that are not necessarily loss-making. In the context of the announcement of the debt standstill in 12th April 2022, which was the only available option at that time to prevent a hard default and sub subsequent far worse uh, outcome than the country is experiencing now, and extreme fiscal constraints, the government needs to raise resources to settle its liabilities, and if such divestments, uh, divestments are to foreign entities, the proceeds can help restore countries depleted foreign reserves while largely reducing the future fiscal burden and improving the overall efficiency of the economy. The divestment is also expected to result in increased productivity, efficiency, and greater economic activity through increased investment going forward. The approval of Cabinet of Ministers has already been received for divestment of several entities, and transaction advisors have been appointed to support these transactions in a professional manner. It will be ensured that such divestments occur following appropriate due diligence and transparent processes. The government has established a state-owned enterprise reform unit to help with SOE restructuring process. Of course, the Director General Mr. Shah is here. You can hear more about uh, this uh, from him. Key reform number five, governance and legislation. To reduce the risk of re uh, recurrence of financial vulnerabilities in SOEs, it becomes crucial to address deeper governance issues in these entities. Most importantly, this applies to the appointments of board members and senior management, regular publishing of audited financial statements, strict discipline over procurement and capital spending, among others. Whilst the government has already taken measures to bring into practice some of these governance requirements in SOEs, legislation will be drafted to provide a legal framework for this the proposed state-owned enterprises legislation and the Public Financial Management Act will together provide an overarching legal framework for the governance of SOEs going forward. The government is also in the process of establishing a holding company, as uh, mentioned earlier, that will eventually take ownership of government-owned corporate assets. This will enable professional management of such assets and ensure corporate governance standards are upheld. The holding company will be government-owned and will be accountable to the Ministry of Finance. I would like to conclude my speech now. The SOI restructuring program is a crucial element of the overall economic reform effort of the country. Given the extremely challenging fiscal conditions, the government has no space to provide transfers to fund SOI losses any longer. Whereas ideally, the, the government should receive more revenues or dividends from each enterprises in the hands of more efficient management. Therefore, a business as usual approach is no longer tenable. Many ADB studies have indeed discussed in detail the overall efficiency gains experienced by Southeast Asian, East Asian, and increasingly South Asian economies through prudent approaches to SOE reforms and creating a conducive environment for private sector activity. In Sri Lanka, the SOE reform measures already put in place, and those in the pipeline will help minimize SOE losses while providing efficient services to the public going forward. The transformation of existing SOEs from fiscal burdens to value creators through such reforms is vital for them to emerge as facilitators of Sri Lanka's process onto the high economic growth trajectory rather than serve as stumbling blocks. Hence, it is essential that there is no rollback of these reforms in the future, as the general public and the workforce have been and could be easily deceived by short-term, selfish, and falsified so-called gains that could be gained by reversing progressive reforms. The proposed legislative measures will help lock in some of these reforms. However, it is essential that there is greater public understanding of the need for such reforms and why any reversal of the same would be detrimental to the public interest in the long run, either directly or indirectly. So with that, I conclude my speech and I wish uh, uh, you would have a, a very good deliberations in these topics uh, during the remainder of the day. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Sirivaradhana, for the very informative address. Next up, it is my honor to invite on stage Mr. Dag Detter, former president of Statum and director of Ministry of Industry and Sweden, uh, Ministry of Industry, Sweden, apologies, to deliver the keynote presentation on SOE reform lessons from other countries. Good morning. Oops. There you go. Thank you very much for having me. Um, good morning to you all. Can you hear me at, at the back? Is it fine? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here. It's a great honor. And um, I'd like to talk about lessons from other countries. Um, the name of the presentation or the, the, the discussion is about SOEs, but I will try to change your mind about that word um, over the course of my presentation. As we've heard from the um, Secretary Treasury and from the um, ADB introductions, this is a very important topic and it has changed its course how we discuss it over the last 20, 25 years, um, because it affects us all. What SOEs does is a very visible thing because they provide often very essential um, products and services to society. And it affects the lives of everybody in a country. But the way we have seen it over the last 50 or 70 years, maybe even 100 years, is that these assets owned by the government at every level of administrations, be it national, federal, regional or local, is a public policy effort. And this has changed over the last, I would say, last 50 years. And what I'm trying to convey is that the best way proven by international practice to view this is not as a policy tool, but as a fiscal tool. This, and therefore, the, the more useful term to use is public commercial assets. And we will define that later. It, it, it means both SOEs, which I prefer to call operational assets, and in real estate, because these, if professionally managed, will produce a fiscal benefit to the country, and which is to the benefit of the society as a whole. There is a benefit of this, as we have heard in, in all the previous speeches, that if we do this properly and manage these professionally, we will increase productivity, growth, investments, and everything. But there's also a risk. So in many countries, not only in developing countries, but most prominently in developing countries, the fiscal risk from SOEs can be you know, 10 to 15%. And this needs to be, first of all, stopped. When we talk about public assets, I have a little cheating note here. Um, I've just, public assets is most of it is hidden because we lack the accounting structures in, uh, in most countries. The only country that really has proper accounting is New Zealand. So Sri Lanka shouldn't feel bad that um, there is no, I've just talked to the Deputy uh, Auditor General to see what are the book values of public assets in Sri Lanka. Uh, and it's not surprising um, because these kind of numbers are very off the reality in almost all countries. 
But the IMF has done a study which has come to the conclusion that public assets, the value of public assets, is in general worth two times GDP, which for Sri Lanka would be about $160 billion. Sorry for talking in dollars, but I, it's easier when you relate it to the GDP. Um, and, and, and also because we're talking trillions, it's, it's a lot of zeros. Um, and, and most of that is unaccounted for and unregulated, which means it also leads to a very inefficient capital allocation. Now, if you step back and think of a glo in a global scale, at least, that amount of wealth is bigger than total value of a, a capital markets around the world, which is regulated, audited, analyzed every second. Compare that to this wealth, which is as big, but is not even audited. Of all total accountants in the world, only 8% work in the public sector. That tells you a lot how inefficiently managed public assets are. On top of that, which is not in the IMF study for the reason that it's not included in the public accounts at all, that's real estate, which in my experience and the research I've done in, in several countries, um, real estate has a value of about one times GDP. This means that for Sri Lanka, the total value of public assets is about 240 billion US dollars. Um, and the, the Auditor General's number that they are able to come up with is $15 billion, while the debt is 85, which we all know. That's the number that is most discussed. But the number I would like to um, highlight is the real market value of your assets less liabilities, which in your case would be actually positive. So you're not broke. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities in this country if you would um, show your assets properly. So the term that I would like to use or, and the concept and the idea that I would like to share with you is public commercial assets, because if you use this, you will open up opportunities which are very useful when you restructure SOEs and when you restructure this, because it's especially when you have loss making assets, the use of real estate inside the SOEs and the real estate as such is a very helpful tool to cover up the losses and to, I wouldn't say dress up, but to prepare SOEs for divestiture. I never use the word privatization because that's a tainted word and it doesn't um, get politicians re-elected. It's better to use that you're doing an industrial strategy, uh, you're doing that something which has a greater vision. Uh, but real estate is usually at least twice the size of, of the SOE sector in a country. And, and uh, an operational side, which I prefer to call it, you know, it's everything from transport utilities and financial services and, and manufacturing companies, while the real estate is buildings and land, but the main value is in the cities, of course. So Colombo is the most important thing. And as we will probably hear from, from um, uh, Christina Chu who, uh, from Temasek, uh, managing commercial assets is one of the core components of Singapore and helped it to bring that economy from a developing country to a developed economy in one single generation. It's an absolutely uh, amazing and an astonishing achievement. And I, I really like to compare because Singapore used to be part of Malaysia and Malaysia is full of resources, oil uh, and all kinds of commodities and, and, and also agricultural products, while Singapore doesn't even didn't at the separation from Malaysia and independence from the British Empire, didn't even have electricity or water to survive. Yet, and they, so they had the same GDP per capita, same kind of people, culture, etc. But today, Singapore, because of a totally different attitude to its wealth and how they manage their economy, 
today has seven times GDP per capita than Malaysia. And one of the, the, the um, architects of this is Go Kong Sui. He was the finance minister and also deputy prime minister um, at different times in the, in, in the setting up of the new Singapore. And one of his leading thoughts was that policy making should be separated from managing commercial assets. And this is a very fundamental idea about managing. Without this idea, there is no way to succeed in restructuring SOEs or public commercial assets, whatever you like to call them. This is the leading thought that means that subsidies, uh, political, short-term political influence must be separated. So what does uh, the best international experience tell us? What, how do you restructure public commercial assets? You need three things. You need to have an understanding of, you need to have the data of your assets. It's no good that only 8% of the accountants work in the public sector. That doesn't work. You need, of course, for the country, IPSAS, um, accounting, etc. But more um, proactively, you need to collect the whole uh, portfolio of public commercial assets, real estate, and under ideally under one leadership and under one accounting framework using IFRS, of course. And then you need to put it in one or several institutions, whatever is suitable for the country, and you need to require uh, recruit the capacity. You have started on that journey, and that's a great um, start. Um, and I'm sure there's lots that can be done more. But let's just talk about the data first. I like this picture because it's from Egypt. This is an institution, this is a building along the Nile that is more than 4,000 years old. It measured the level of the, of the Nile in order to meet out how much tax should be um, uh, levied on, on the population. Today we miss that kind of data on the, the, the public assets, so we don't know what kind of yield they should have. And this is the point. Public commercial assets is just like we're saying, that's why the name, I like the name so much, um, commercial assets. They, tomorrow they can be owned by the private sector. They probably historically have been owned by the private sector and they were, um, they were owned because they wanted to uh, have a yield from them. And that shouldn't exclude, even if the government, ownership is irrelevant. Even if the government owns an asset, which is a commercial asset, it should yield um, money. Because if we don't have, and, and, and to, in order to understand what kind of yield we want to have from these assets, we have to know the market value. Because if we don't know the market value, we don't know what yield. So it all starts with understanding the data about the assets, what they're worth. There's no use of counting that you have 400 SOEs. That's completely irrelevant because it's only 50 out of the, that, that really counts. And out of the 50, it's probably only 10 that is uh, the core of the whole thing. Um, so it's more important to talk about what is the value of the portfolio and what is the yield that we should get out of this. Otherwise, you end up like most countries, most cities, most regions with their real estate. They don't even know where it is. The famous example which was brought to, to the world's attention is from Copacabana in Brazil, where the, the economist of the IMF was walking and he wrote a, a short IMF paper on this, which is probably the most fascinating IMF paper because there's no numbers in it. It's just a story. This is an absolutely serious IMF paper. He says, I'm walking along Copacabana and suddenly among the five-star hotels, high-rise buildings, there is a small school. This is a perfect example of a bad, of a poor capital allocation for the public sector. This school could be moved to another district and the pupils wouldn't be distracted by all the people having fun on the beach. And the government would make a killing by building a, a five-star hotel, and they could probably build 20 schools for that money. It's, 
it all comes down to the accounting. Governments use cash accounting. So when they see a vacant lot, they put a car park there in order to get cash flow from the parking fees. But a, a person from the private sector, a business person who are used to balance sheets, which doesn't exist in the government accounting system, will see there's a potential to build a building that we, we can have a we can have five stories parking lots in the basement. We can have uh, residential units. We can have office units. And we both create value and we multiply the cash flow from the same real estate plot. American politicians often pride themselves of saying, um, I remember the first time I visited uh, an American government official, he said, well, we're not socialists like you guys in, the, in, the, in Europe. We are capitalists. So we don't have any uh, uh, public assets. The reality is that the US has probably, or not probably, they have a lot more public assets than most European countries. But it's not in their balance sheet. So the mayor of Pittsburgh said, we don't have any assets. We probably have you know, 300 real estate uh, assets and we use them all. Fortunately, I had done the analysis before, and they had 12,000 real estate assets. The book value, or the market value, of those real estate assets was 70 times the value that they had in their books. That shows you a little bit of the, of the uh, discrepancies between what's in the accounts, what is, what is seen, and what is, because what's seen, what is measured, counts, and is managed. If it's not measured, it won't, won't count and it won't be managed. And every US city that we've gone through is about 45. They have real estate assets which dominates every city. It's more than 50% of the real estate market in that city. And it's one times GDP of that city. London is another example. The London subway, just like San Francisco and every other major urban center in the world, have been struggling during the pandemic. The cash flow has been close to zero because nobody is leaving their homes. Nobody left their homes. TfL, which is the subway of London or the transport system, they were lacking money and they wanted to get billions of dollars from the UK government. The reality was that they didn't have any record of their real estate. There was 80 billion worth of real estate missing in their accounts, but they could instead monetize and pay to refurbish, uh, invest in, in the, both of the operation, but also of the upgrade of the subway. And this would be, this would make almost the UK public net worth positive. Both the UK and the US are, have a negative pu uh, uh, public uh, net worth. <clears throat> and all of this comes back to the accounting. This accounting, accrual accounting, is more than 900 years old. It was invented in Persia, <clears throat> refined in Italy in the, in the 14 the 1500s, and has basically is the one of the most unappreciated inventions of mankind, of modern history because it's the fundament of uh, market, uh, market economy. It's the fundament of creating uh, a stock exchange, uh, trading, even a limited liability company. You can't do that without accrual accounting. This is the origin of the wealth that we are all appreciating today and enjoying. Yet, public sector all over the world has not taken this to heart. New Zealand has adapted this. And this has helped them to also weather uh, several of their natural catastrophes. And they, have, they are as prone to natural catastrophes. They're actually rated by Lloyds in London worse than Bangladesh. Because they're so prone to earthquakes, tornadoes, and, and tsunamis. But they weather them because they have a very strong net worth. And that is what's guiding their financial principles and, and fiscal measures. <clears throat> and the IMF has also 
following all these um, discussions, done research which shows that governments with a stronger net worth comes out quicker from a, from a, uh, a recession, but also has lower borrowing costs. And from a practical level, the way to do this is to also include in public commercial assets the real estate. And you don't have to wait for IPSAS to in include it. You can do it very quickly. Somebody like Suresh Shah could do this in a couple of weeks, even if you don't have a cadastre. But we would like the, all the IFIs, the ADBs, etc., to help Sri Lanka with a cadastre, because that would be extremely helpful to get the title correctly, etc. But in the meantime, you can do an asset map in a few months that will get you an understanding where the assets are, because this could be helpful both to create a yield, fiscal space, and to help people like Suresh when they're restructuring <coughs> um, uh, the SOEs. And this is not rocket science. It was done a thousand years ago in the UK or in England then by Willem the Conqueror. And it can be done today with the technology that we have much easier, of course. Um, the second thing is what you're discussing here is to create a professional institution to insulate this from um, short term political influence. And this is really important because the private sector is not very likely to engage and, and not even very interested to engage with the government because they're always afraid. Good investors are always afraid to deal with the government because it might get them involved in corruption that they don't want to get involved in. So having a professional institution in between is an absolutely a critical part of the process to involve the private sector and get FDIs into the country. And the uh, institution has to be a holding company. It can't be an agency, it can't be a part of the government. It has to have the same characteristics. It has to feel and smell like a private sector company. I, 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 I call it a public wealth fund, um, but the legal structure is a holding company. Uh, uh, yeah, corporate incorporated. And this is different from a sovereign wealth fund, which is uh, taking a surplus, asset, surplus revenues from, from export and uh, in order to avoid a Dutch disease is investing that abroad because otherwise you, you would create inflation in the country. Public wealth fund only handles the domestic assets inside the country. So that's Temasek in Singapore, while the sovereign wealth fund is GIC. And the way to do this is very simple. I mean, this is done in the private sector every day. So it's not rocket science, and there's no reason to go into the work streams that is involved with this, but it's, it's, it's um, um, the challenge with this is always the political will. This is the challenge. I mean, the technicalities about this is done in the private sector every day. And we've now set up the first two public wealth funds in, in Africa, one in Ethiopia and one in Nigeria. So to say, and, and there are public wealth funds in Pakistan, uh, in, in, in lots of developing countries. So the argument that this <clears throat> is only a, a thing for developing countries or developing eco uh, developed economies is not, um, does not really hold. And what you're trying to achieve with the holding company Apart from the balance sheet, the accounting, uh, and the, uh, regulate, uh, the regulatory uh, and the insights, etc., of these assets, is that you have a commercial objective. You're taking away the whole policy objective. So all the all the um, um, public service obligations, all the subsidies, has to be separated out. Uh, and of course, proper accounting will help you to get that settled. And then there has to be some kind of an independence from short term political, of course, influence, because the long term, of course, that is a, this is a political instrument for the long term, but it shouldn't affect the day to day um, work of somebody leading such a, such an entity. Same thing with this is most countries agree on this when you come this far. 
the place where everything stops, like hitting a brick wall, is when you're going to select the supervisory board or the non-executive board for such an entity. Because that's when politics becomes almost impossible. So I've tried to put up some guidelines. What kind of people and why do you need them? The purpose of this company, a holding company, is to create value. How do you create value? There are three strategies to create value. Operational, capital structure, and business development. So everybody on the board should have those kind of qualities that they can contribute to the board's work and support the executive management in that kind, in that kind of work. Of course, we shouldn't forget the risk factor. So we need people also who can help to minimize the risk. And they need to be sourced from the relevant backgrounds, which means, and this is the contagious point which I had when I run this, run this um, effort more than 20 years ago, my prime minister said to me, he came down to me absolutely furious because I was changing 85, 90% of all the board members, 90% um, of all the CFOs and CEOs, and he was getting worried because his friends were all kicked out and they were getting quite um, uh, irritated with me. He said, what do you have against politicians? I have nothing against politicians. You're great in parliament, but you know, we're running a company, yeah, but we have lots to contribute. And this is why I set this up. This is what's needed in order to be able to argue, you know, what is the background of this person? Does it really help? And in the execution, we mustn't forget that such a holding company, the second thing that is often a stumbling stone is that you don't pay these people inside the holding company market rates. And after a lot of fighting with my prime minister in Sweden, I learned the, the phrase which I've used in every country in Africa, Asia, Latin America, everywhere in Europe, is that the, the compensation to the management of such a company should be market rate, not market leading, but market rate, because otherwise it is offensive to the taxpayers. And also with advisors, they must have the mandate to hire professional advisors. If you pay peanuts, to the advisors, you get monkeys. You need the, you need the world leading advisors in order to run such a thing. You are presenting these assets to the world and how you present them is absolute in what sequence and in what fashion is absolutely critical to the foreign investment climate of this country. And everything should smell and feel like it is a professional process, like if it was run by they nobody should feel the difference between a private sector owner and this and that was exactly the mandate that i got when i was recruited by the by the swedish government but the best example worldwide is of course temasek because they have done this since 1974 and they've had a yield of more than 14 percent and that's the ambition i think you should have when we did this in sweden we were on the cusp of getting um, advised by the IMF and the Prime Minister said I don't want the IMF inside this door I want to hire somebody who can handle this as if it was privately owned and I, I had the fortune or the misfortune because you get a lot of stabs in your back and a lot of scars when you run such an effort but I had the um, um, well I was um, in charge of this for three years to turn these 65 companies around and we um, did that and had a yield which was, of course, because it was a first time effort, was much higher than the 14% of Temasek. Uh, and we uh, created a lot of strategic partnerships with, uh, with investors from all around the world. And of course, we outperformed the stock market because uh, it, it was such a massive turnaround uh, and lots of um, laid off numbers of workers and uh, and turned around bankrupt companies but without having one dollar coming in from the budget from the taxpayers because we use the real estate in almost every restructuring of companies and we never sold a company that wasn't profitable so we we we, we streamlined every company so that whatever we sold was a profitable commercially viable company 
And this is very important because we saw every encounter with the investors or foreign journalists or whoever, even the unions, everybody, we saw them as, um, we treated them as if we were a private entity talking to our stakeholders. MTR uh, in, in, uh, in then Hong Kong um, is, is one of the best examples of using real estate for the benefit of an operational asset. They have built a, a, a transport system bigger than that of the New York, much more efficient, uh, without using one tax dollar, because they use the real estate above each station, which today still contributes to more than 30, 40% of their revenues. We did this, something similar when we did OPCO Propcos of our real estate in every SOE. We separated out the real estate, created a separate real estate company that then funded both infrastructure, the restructuring, and uh, lots of other things. Uh, the UK has done it in one example by accident, uh, it could be said, but it's still paid for part of the Olympics. Copenhagen has done it with uh, the old harbor. Uh, Hamburg has done the same thing, created lots of housing uh, and, and uh, office space and paid for infrastructure. And we took one of the largest, we took, uh, we collected some of the uh, best nationally owned real estate and put it in a holding company, which is today paying the pensions of the Swedish uh, taxpayers. So that's the optimistic message that I have, and that this is... Uh, um, an opportunity that you shouldn't miss because you have huge values. You have probably somewhere around 120 billion in your balance sheet of public commercial assets. And only if we use the IMF uh, yield that they say would be reasonable to get from public assets, 3%, that is <clears throat> much more than you're getting from all the IFIs today, which would be a very valuable contribution. I'm not saying you should replace the, the, the money that you are uh, thankfully getting from the IFIs, but you have a, your own contribution to the budget deficit and to the building of your country and, and bringing it into uh, a, a more efficient and profitable economy. And, you, and I really believe you have fantastic assets and you can do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ditter, for that uh, very informative uh, presentation. And with that, uh, we shall move on to our panel discussion on SOA reforms, challenges, and opportunities for Sri Lanka. And for the panel, let me invite on stage Mr. Suresh Shah, chairperson of the SOA restructuring unit of Sri Lanka, and Mr. David Robinet, senior public management specialist of the public sector management and governance sector of ADB. And joining us virtually are Ms. Christina Chu, Managing Director of Americas and Institutional Relations of Temasek International Private Limited, Singapore. Ms. Anne Molyneux, Member of the OECD Business and Advice, uh, Industry Advisory Committee and Consultant at ADB, IFC, OECD and World Bank. And Mr. Adrian Torres, Director of Special Initiatives and Funds at the Office of Markets Development and Public-Private Partnership at ADB. And to moderate today's session, I invite on stage Dr. Roshan Pereira, Senior Research Fellow at Advocata Institute of Sri Lanka. And ladies and gentlemen, this will be followed by a Q&A session. So let me remind you again to send in your questions through the digital form. For in-person attendees, there's a QR code on your table. And for virtual participants, uh, I believe the, um, uh, the link may have already been posted on the chat. And uh, with that, I invite all the invitees to the stage. Good morning and welcome again uh, to this session. Uh, we have just 
uh, heard from ST and DAG on uh, first on the SOE restructuring progress that has been made in Sri Lanka, as well as some of the global experience. Uh, we have a very eminent panel uh, who are working on SOE reform across various parts of the world. Uh, so now let's hear from them, uh, fr from their experience uh, on how uh, you know, other countries have undertaken this SOE reform uh, and what lessons Sri Lanka can learn uh, from uh, this as we seek to uh, undertake this comprehensive reform. Uh, to start out, I'm going to uh, turn to Suresh. Uh, you, ST, basically, he, he uh, set out the approach that Sri Lanka is taking on SOE reform. Um, and, and as now as chairman of the restructuring unit, uh, would you like to add anything on about this pro the progress that has been made thus far? Uh, and also, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, we, I think we heard a lot about this whole governance is, is one of the critical issues in, in, uh, in, in, in a, with SOEs. Uh, what are the plans for setting up a holding company for Sri Lanka? So it's a two-part two, two part question. So Roshan, um, uh, firstly, thank you to the ADB for mm -hmm. having me here this morning. Uh, Roshan, your question is, is kind of deserves a bit of a long answer, but I'll try to summarize. So if you, if you think of the last 75 years since we've had independence, uh, we've had these SOEs, and uh, if you see the outcomes of these SOEs, uh, they've not given citizens or the consumer uh, decent quality products or services. Uh, yes, we've got up to very recently, we've got uh, subsidized pricing, which obviously helped the citizens, but uh, that was not sustainable. It resulted in a deep financial crisis for us. So that's, so that's not, that was not a good outcome either. Um, <clears throat> At the same time, we've been the SOEs have been a fairly significant burden on the fiscal government's uh, fiscal efforts. So, from a from a consumer or a citizen's perspective, and from the perspective of a government, these SOEs have not really uh, perf uh, not really performed. They have not delivered. Right. Uh, then you got to so that's on the one side, and then on the other side, you got to ask yourself why this has these have been the outcomes. And fundamentally, there are three or four reasons. So firstly, we parked subsidies in these enterprises, uh, which doesn't lead to sustainable entities, number one. Uh, number two, we've not managed these enterprises properly, and that's seen in the kinds of boards that we've appointed over the years. Uh, boards have not been appointed because the, the people are qualified to run entities, but more because of whom they know. Uh, and thirdly, we've, uh, we've created jobs which were not there within these SOEs, right? So they, it's led to a lot of overstaffing. And uh, fourthly, there has been misuse of SOE assets, uh, the corruption that ST also referred to. So these, so the outcomes are the result of fundamentally of these four things. So, if, so moving forward, if you are going to change, if you are going to transform these entities so that at the end of the day, they provide better quality goods and services to citizens, if the pricing is going to be reasonable, if availability is going to be convenient, uh, and if these entities are not going to be a fiscal burden going forward, we've got to address those four issues. Don't park the subsidies, create better boards, have the right kind of uh, capacity, uh, knowledge and people within the organizations and make sure that the governance structures are good. So it is with this intention that we've submitted uh, a, a policy SOE policy document to government. They incorporate a lot of these things that I just spoke about. Uh, it incorporates the creation of a holding company, which uh, and uh, fortunately the, the cabinet has approved this policy document. Uh, so now the policy has got to be implemented uh, step by step. And we are also creating the legal framework. So we've started working on a state-owned enterprise act as, uh, as ST mentioned. Um, the policy itself incorporates a number, it, it's, it's built around nine principles. Uh, I'll just uh, speak on a couple of them. Uh, so, for example, if you take a listed company, which might have, say, for example, a thousand shareholders, uh, these entities are compelled to publish quarterly accounts in addition to annual accounts, right? Um, uh, SOE has 22 million, in Sri Lanka, SOE has 22 million shareholders. 
but these SOEs are not compelled to disclose uh, quarterly leave alone annual uh, annual leave alone quarterly accounts. So we are saying that's that's not right. These SOEs need to disclose quarterly accounts in addition to annual accounts. And and the current state, uh, unfortunately, is there are some some SOEs that don't have last year's audited accounts in place at this moment in time. Some some are three four years behind, right? So these things need to be corrected. Uh, similarly, we proposed a mechanism to appoint directors uh, to the holding company that we spoke of, as well as the directors to the SOEs themselves. Okay. Um, then we've also, uh, ST spoke about the, uh, the link between loss making SOEs and how they rely on the state banks. Um, so one of the things that we put down in the policy, one of the principles is that we've got to take the SOEs out of relying on state banks via treasury guarantees, right? Uh, we need to, for example, to bring, to bring in uh, single borrower limits uh, and so on and so forth. So there are nine principles around which the SOE policy has been structured and we are turning that into a piece of legislation as well uh, to govern the SOEs that may remain within government. Now, this brings me to an important point because uh, so far, we've come across about 130 commercial state-owned enterprises. Uh, of these 130, about 15 or so could be liquidated because they really don't perform any function at all. There are no operations. Uh, <clears throat> there are also about 20-something enterprises that most likely need to remain under control of government, but they could move under a, a, a PPP uh, strategy. Uh, but fundamentally, that leaves around 80 something entities that government does not really need to control. Uh, they are they don't have a public service obligation. They are not in they, they do not supply an essential product or service. There is no market failure. So these can be much better uh, and uh, much better run, much mu much more profitable, much more productive under private hands. Um, so so this is the very broad kind of. Uh, uh, strategy that that we are following uh, in terms of the uh, soe restructuring um, having said that we are very conscious about you know the politics of the country elections coming up um, so we've got a narrow time frame and we are trying to do all a, a quite a number of things um, within this very narrow time frame thank you uh, suresh for that very comprehensive answer um, i'm going to now move to christina uh, I think Dag talked about uh, the experience of Singapore uh, and how the management of public assets helped uh, move the economy from a developing uh, country to a, a developed country. And I think one of the key uh, reforms he spoke about was the separation of asset management from policy making. Uh, so listening to what Suresh has shared about the holding company um, uh, concept in Sri Lanka and drawing from your experience from Temasek, what are some of the uh, things that uh, you you or recommendations you have for Sri Lanka as they uh, go about setting up this uh, SOE holding company? Um, good morning, everyone. So first, I would like to thank Dag for presaging my comments. He has done a deep study of various systems, and we can only speak from personal experience. So I would just add that on the state's role as owner, the OECD's guidelines for corporate governance of state-owned enterprises recommends that governments simplify and standardize their legal forms under which SOEs operate. Their operational practices should follow commonly accepted corporate norms. The government should allow SOEs full operational autonomy to achieve their defined commercial objectives and refrain from unduly intervening in the management of SOEs. So we at Tamasic believe the OECD makes valid observations. Tamasic was created as a company to separate the government's policy-making role from the management of commercial assets. This separation of roles allows Tamasic to operate based on the principles of commerciality and accountability. Just as Tamasic's shareholder does not interfere or direct our day-to-day -day operations, we similarly at Tamasic do not direct or interfere with the day-to-day -day operations of our portfolio companies. 
We hold the respective boards responsible for the portfolio company's performance and expect them to abide by sound corporate governance principles. Importantly, as Dag alluded to, Singapore can sustain Tamasic not only because we have the right organizational structure, but because Singapore has the political will to abide by the separation of roles. On this, I can do no better than to quote from our Prime Minister's speech at the 2020 Annual Public Service Leadership Dinner. He said, We can sustain organizations like Tamasic and GIC. They are deliberately created as companies rather than government departments to afford them a greater degree of autonomy. They are insulated from political pressures and bureaucratic interference to give them the space to make sound investment decisions. It works not only because we have the right organizational structure, but because we have the political will to do things the right way and to see things through. And we have built up the right culture and value in the civil service. So officers appointed know their role and know what is the right thing for them to do. This arrangement has enabled us to steward and build up our reserves and has greatly benefited our people. It is an arrangement unique to Singapore. It puzzles others studying us. They come, they look, they ask many questions. They see our organizational charts. Eventually, they may understand how we make it work, but they will have great difficulty doing the same in a different political climate. But in Singapore, all this is possible, and it is possible only because of the stable, well-functioning political system that we have created, inherited, and maintained." Unquote. Hope this helps. Thank you, Christina. That is very uh, useful, I think, uh, in terms of understanding the Tevasek model. Uh, but I think that uh, Tevasek model is something that we are more familiar with. But I, I, there are other models that we are less familiar with, and I'm going to move to one of them, uh, and that's closer to home. Um, uh, and I move to Anne, because you have worked with other ownership uh, entities, including the Druk Holding and Investments Limited in Bhutan. Uh, so looking at their experience and how they set it up, uh, what advice would you have for Sri Lanka in the creation of a new holding company? Well, thank you very much, uh, and good morning to you all. Good morning, distinguished guests and fellow panellists and colleagues. Um, and thank you very much to the ADP for including me on this panel. Uh, just quietly, I can say I'm reasonably proud of the work that was done in Bhutan to establish the holding company and also to ensure that it was operating along the right path. Just to follow on from Christine, a holding company, I believe, needs overt leadership support. And we started with that in Bhutan. We had the Royal King, the Royal Charter established by the King um, to establish DHI. What he said went, but he was solely interested and had a vision for the best practices of state-owned enterprises in Bhutan. In Bhutan, they comprise almost all the economy. There is very little, there is small, um, but very little other private sector businesses. All the big businesses are state-owned enterprises. And he was, the king was concerned for the long-term viability of the country. Um, in something like, in the year when I started uh, advisory work there in Bhutan in setting up the holding company, um, they had... Uh, $342 million US dollars coming in from all their combined state-owned enterprises. In 2023, after setting up the holding company and the policies and processes that holding companies and the state-owned enterprises needed, it now contributes $3.2 billion to the coffers of Bhutan. So it is, uh, I believe, a success story based on what you call exactly, Christine, the political will. Um, in Bhutan, we had three levels of um, state-owned enterprises. Some were 100% owned by the government, some were more than 50% owned by the government, and some were under 50% owned by the government, but under the influence and control of the government. Um, 
when we come to this political will thing, the success story of the companies there was not only the leadership at DHI, and when they started DHI, there was something like under 10 employees. And it's now a much bigger organisation because it's taken on much bigger activities and much more proactive in terms of the professional um, monitoring of the state-owned enterprises. Um, the companies themselves needed committed leadership and, uh, and great, they needed to be empowered to take the authority, to run the company commercially and to wear the consequences and be accountable for the decisions. Now, um, the holding company, holding company leadership, therefore, is important and state-owned enterprise leadership is important. And that comes to the comment uh, about boards and capabilities of boards. The boards of the state-owned enterprises uh, need to have serious knowledge of corporate governance, as does the, the board of the holding company and holding company executives. Um, they need to understand what is the normal expectations of a commercial company and fulfil those expectations. It comes down to board appointments, and uh, you referred to independent directors and independence of board members, not all of them, but some of them, um, moving away from uh, the ne nepotistic kind of appointments that have traditionally been the um, venue of state-owned enterprises. Um, appointment of fellow bureaucrats or former ministers and so on, all of whom might have very good knowledge of government activities, but very poor knowledge of commercial activities. So the board appointments become important. What else was important? There was actually a very clear relationship distinguished between the government um, and the holding company and the holding company and the state-owned enterprises. Um, I was asked to write their ownership, uh, their holding company ownership policy and statement. And in actual fact, they wanted everything to be as best practice as it could. And I know myself, Christine, I actually recommended they have a little chat with Tomasic to see with uh, how you organised for your, not only your um, ownership structure, but also how um, the holding company operates with its state-owned enterprises. What we had to also work on was quality processes for strategy development and for risk reporting. Um, the state-owned enterprises were really taking just whatever strategies the government were giving them and not actually looking a little bit more broadly on the opportunities that they might take up and expand because in their bureaucratic mind, it was a case of this was what the government wanted immediately. But they, if they looked further down, and governments tended to work from budget to budget, annual cycle to annual cycle, rather than if they looked further down the cycles into the future, they could see the opportunities and benefits of renewables and the renewables industries that so went forward. Um, uh, the other the other thing is they, the the, uh, the holding company needed to set up not quality processes just for strategy development but also for risk management, but for investments um, and also for the monitoring requirements the holding company had to provide back to the government. I think if I was to talk about the biggest challenges that Bhutan had, they had they had really committed individuals. Perhaps the challenge was those committed individuals needed to have a lot more development and training themselves in the governance of a company in order to be able to provide that appropriate governance. And the second biggest challenge was, again, related to human, hu human uh, resources. Rather, that the biggest change was a mindset to move from being a state-owned enterprise, from being a bureaucratic government mindset, to that being a commercial mindset, to understand you are going to have strategies and objectives you need to meet with, associated with KPIs for performance. You need to report against those. And that was setting those was a bit of a challenge. And I remember one particular day I was there and we were having an extensive discussion about uh, the strategy and performance measures and how we're we going to negotiate the performance measures and so forth. And um, one general manager was really very irritated. And he said to me, well, 
quite frankly, what does the holding company do if I just say, no, I'm not doing this, I'm not setting KPIs? And I said, well, I'd suggest you have just a quiet discussion with them, an extensive discussion, and see if you can find a way. But I said, my advice in the end to the holding company, if you hold that line, would be you're probably not the right person to lead this activity, this, this um, SOE. So there were a lot of hard discussions, sorting out um, the legal structure, the clarification of roles between the SOEs, CEOs, line ministries, um, and Ministry of Finance. I think the last thing that really in the time I've got I'd like to mention is the fact that there has been, and to go to Doug's point, there has been a very recent issue in Bhutan about land. You see, all of the state-owned enterprises all owned, had had land holdings, and it was seen as an asset of the company. Um, DHI has recently transferred from the state-owned enterprises the, those land holdings so that they can actually um, be um, use them as a as an asset to a better to a better outcome um, to use it for to facilitate better lending, better borrowing, better investments in the future. And um, to, But to go through that was quite a complex process. They had to, first of all, get the agreement with the National Land Commission. Um, st some state-owned enterprises had mortgaged their land. What do you do about a mortgage? The mortgage holder had a, a legitimate mortgage. It needed to be paid out or you needed his agreement to transfer the land back. And um, therefore, also, what happens when a state-owned enterprise is thinking of acquiring more land? So land and real estate is a separate issue uh, that can be dealt with. But um, I think Bhutan has been, uh, it's a small country, but it was able to get things done because it's a small country. And uh, so I think uh, the, the benefits are there uh, for Sri Lanka to see, to learn from, and uh, I wish you well on your journey. Thank you, Anne, for that uh, comprehensive answer. Um, I'm going to move to you, David, because you've worked a lot in, in Asia on SOE reform. Um, so what is the motivation really for having these, setting up these centralized ownership structures? Uh, we've already heard of two examples of, you know, where this has worked. Uh, but what are the other success stories or what are the, what is the experience? What has the experience been in Asia of these kind of holding companies? So there are there is a movement towards uh, centralized ownership entities in Asia. Uh, Temasek is, is one of the big pioneers. Um, but with some delay, now there's been many others that are trying to move in that direction. I think we've heard basically what the, the key motivations are. There's two parts. One is to clearly give a commercial focus to the companies versus a more dispersed, uh, ambiguous policy or political motivation to give a commercial motivation and to bring in that professionalism, corporate governance, transparency, et cetera. We've, we've heard about that. We've also heard about the other side of it, which is, you know, the companies, then there's the entity, the holding company, the centralized ownership entity, and then there's the government, right? The entity creates basically a shield or at least a buffer between the ministers, the politicians, and the rest of the government and the companies. It creates a buffer to reduce that political interference and all of the problems that then we have seen here and so many other places that follow. Um, so that's kind of the, in a very, in a nutshell, that's really the theory behind it. To talk about the practice, there's two ways to look at it, kind of the negative and the positive. And the negative is where you look at where places have not centralized. You know, we're now a few decades into this kind of post privatization SOE reform era. And in that era, there have been examples of Sweden and Singapore and other places that have centralized, but there's always been holdouts, many, many holdouts who say, well, yes, we have a decentralized system, but it works fine. Our system works for us. The number of times that I've heard that, I cannot tell you, our system works for us. In those places where their system worked for them, decentralized systems, still primarily under the control of different ministries, has then come the spectacular failures. The spectacular failures. It's not just Sri Lanka, it's not just Asia. I can think of a couple of other continents. They've each had the huge SOE failure in a decentralized system that works for them. And these are middle-income countries, relatively advanced countries. Um, one of them 
had the leading electricity company on its continent. Politicians got involved. It's been years of rolling blackouts. It's been years of incredibly high costs to the economy. And they still haven't fixed it yet. It's, it's gone on and on and on. Decentralized system. And there's so many other examples like that of failure in decentralized systems. So there's the negative. The positive is centralized systems, you know, don't always work perfectly. Um, so we, the ADB, we've been involved in some, uh, a little bit with DHI, but not so much, but some other ones, we're trying to get them to work better. Um, but sometimes they really do work better and bringing them in really makes a change. So I've, we've heard of a couple examples. I'll give an example. It's not technically a holding company. It's an entity, but it has some of the properties of a holding company. Uh, and it's from a, a country that's uh, like Sri Lanka. It's a democracy, an imperfect democracy, a very exciting democracy in our home country of the Philippines, ADB. So it's, it's a little bit different than Bhutan or Singapore. Uh, they have very exciting elections and very exciting things around those elections. But there, um, after several scandals, several problems of which you'd be familiar with, they finally say we have to do something. They created the entity, the entity had very broad powers in terms of restructuring, in terms of dealing with SOEs and changing the boards, bringing in performance management and bringing in private sector people in the entity in the companies to have that focus, that return on capital focus. And a lot of things happen, but one thing, big thing that happened was they, they, the losses went down, the government transfers went down, the dividends went up. In the Philippines, the dividends went up so much after they introduced the ownership entity that for a while they had a dividend day. Every year, they would actually have all the SOEs come together and instead of saying how terrible they were, come together and say all of the dividends they were paying to the government because the number had gone up so much, it had become a major revenue stream. So we've seen, you know, it's possible in many, there's other examples I give, but it's possible in many places that you really can have a turnaround by bringing in an entity that has that commercial focus and capability. Thank you, David. Um, so I, th there are the two sides to it. There are success stories, but there are also failures in this process. Um, so I'm going to turn to you, Adrian. Given, as David um, also mentioned, ADB has been working in this space for a while, working with other countries uh, on their reform process. Um, how can the ADB and particularly the market development and public private partnerships uh, office in which you are attached help uh, Sri Lanka in this SOE process to ensure success rather than failure? Mm. Well, thanks for this. And thank you for inviting me in this serendipity knowledge event. Um, look, I, I will frame it. In, in a sense that, you know, when we were the Office of Public-Private Partnership, our entry points and in terms of our support to our, you know, DMC clients has always been on the upstream side uh, and then the midstream transaction advisory to help in downstream financing, you know, to partner with, you know, with, with, the, with the government entity, um, you know, in, 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 in financing and operating these assets. So I think this key... Uh, themes will still run uh, as 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 an office of market development PPPs. You know, Doug mentioned that you know in order for us to bring in um, you know some of these reforms, you know, you need to have data, you need to have institutional reforms, and you have that capacity. And in some way, PPP we do that when we engage with our you know uh, DMC clients because what we do is we identify what those assets are. We, we really kind of like jot it down to the, the last minute detail so that to understand what is this value of this real asset. And, and to layer that, we provide capacity building. You know, we set up PPP uh, centers. We we set up, uh, you know, we even uh, assist them in say in the, in the, in the law, um, you know, PPP law and, and some of the reforms. And to add to that, we give them capacity, you know, we bring in expert, you know, there's PPP centers, and it would be similar, I think, in, in this approach, uh, you know, to, to, to assist our DMC, you know, I, I heard about divestments. I'll probably look at, say, you know, even like monetization of assets would be something similar and akin to what we're trying to do now. You're trying to bring in some, uh, you know, fiscal relief by monetizing of your existing assets, but not really giving it to the private sector. The way to do this, I guess, is that you know you you bring in 
all of those expertise, uh, you bring in reforms, uh, you bring in the capacity of the government so that then the value can be asked better if you, if, in, in the time where you want to divest it. So therefore creating a much better value down the line. So in that, in that frame, I, I would say that, you know, we are there, uh, you know, from all the cycle uh, of, of our engagement with the government and the Office of Market Development can, can, can really partner with you uh, in, in terms of the upstream work and the capacity building, uh, you know, and the reforms. And we'll be working, of course, with some of our colleagues who are here and here uh, to support that. And in the transaction side of the business and to bring in, uh, you know, crowd in private party in, in the downstream side, uh, you know, because as they said, if you manage the asset professionally, there's a fiscal benefit. And I think that's what we're trying to do as well with our service under the, the new Office of Market Development and PPPs. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Adrian, for that. Um, I'm going to now move a little bit <clears throat> beyond the, uh, the holding company to actually talk about SOE reforms or the SOEs themselves. Uh, we are living in a very dynamic and changing environment, bo both domestically and globally. Uh, and so, Christian, I'm just going to ask you, how has, you know, how has the Temasek changed as the, you know, environment, the global environment has changed? But how have also the SOEs uh, themselves um, adapted to this changing environment? So reform SOEs and their state owners cannot rest on their laurels. Each SOE and its state owner must ensure that the SOE is positioned for growth and transformation and has a resilient business model. So just let me give you two examples of how Tmasek has engage with its SOEs or with its portfolio companies to help in their um, journey. First, on sustainability and climate change. We believe that all of us have to be on a journey for climate change. Our portfolio companies have to have a climate change strategy for transition, mitigation, and adaptation. We regularly engage our portfolio companies to understand the challenges they face in climate transition and to convey our expectations. We prioritize and target our engagement efforts with companies where we see the highest potential for impact. Secondly, we have to make sure that our portfolio companies can withstand exogenous shocks because these shocks come more often and in shorter timeframes today. Some of our companies went through phenomenal shocks recently. Singapore Airlines is one. In March 2020, Singapore Airlines had to shut down its operations. It was looking at a 96% drop in revenue from $18 billion to less than a billion dollars a year. That was the forecast Singapore Airlines showed to Masik, the one-year forecast to financial year 2021. And hence the support that Tomasic and other public shareholders gave to Singapore Airlines when Singapore Airlines announced its rights offering because Tomasic knew there was something valuable to be preserved. And that's where the strength of the balance sheet came in. And today, Singapore Airlines is doing incredibly well because of that funding. We hold our respective boards responsible for their portfolio companies' performance and expect them to abide by sound corporate principles I mentioned earlier. Thus, Tomasic Incorporated as a company subjects itself to the same disciplines as other companies in the private sector, abiding by, for example, accounting standards and with its board of directors complying with attendant fiduciary duties to the company. Thank you, Christine, for that. Uh, just keeping on the theme of this dynamic changes and challenges, uh, I think Sri Lanka, the momentum for this SOE reform uh, restarted with, with the, you know, the environment that we faced uh, from sometime last year. Um, what challenges have you encountered thus far in terms of this whole SOE reform process? And what kind of... Uh, solutions or how do you propose to address them because i'm sure there must be to, to ensure that this reform process is sustainable and that we will keep moving on this reform process so we expected a lot of pushback um, from the trade unions for example and uh, i must say that the pushback has not been anywhere as uh, significant as we thought it would be uh, so they do have concerns. They have concerns on the uh, on the continuity of their employment. They have concerns around terms and conditions of employment. Uh, however, uh, whilst uh, and and they have articulated what I'm going to say next, 
Um, I think that that seems to be the most important point that they were in the event privatization or divestment does happen. Uh, they want to see good, credible investors coming into these entities. I think that's the overall feel that we are getting. Um, I, I think they understand the need for, for the reforms. Um, I think not just the trade unions, but I believe the public in general, uh, the feeling that we are getting is that they do understand that the country cannot be governed as it has been governed in the last 75 years that it is essential that we need transformation and and these reforms that we are talking about not just soe reforms but other types of reforms as well are needed i think that that feeling is generally there in the public so that has been supportive um the uh, real constraints that we have faced and i'm now taking I'm, I'm you know i come from the private sector so i come from that perspective uh, government systems and processes are very different right and um, so sometimes there is a lot of frustration because we can't do things as fast as we would want to uh, because the systems and processes are so different from the private sector so that builds frustration and i must also say that there is a level of entrenched interest uh, uh, both um, you know within the service as as well as within some of the entities themselves which 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 are which are a little bit of a pushback but we've got to work through these challenges um, so yeah, there, there are challenges, but uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, we all understand that what we are doing is necessary uh, for the country and we will take it a step at a time. Thank you, uh, Suresh. So that sounds very um, optimistic. Uh, and I hope that you'll be able to achieve uh, what you've, you have set out to do. Uh, but I'd also like to turn to you, David, and ask you, what are some of the su success factors of other countries in terms of their SOE reform process? Because I'm sure uh, most countries face this kind of pushback, but how have they addressed it and how have they been able to push through with these reforms? Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about that being here because I've been in, I've been in multiple countries now in the wake of the IMF. The IMF comes in as a crisis. They generally call for SOE reform. They like SOE laws. But they don't actually tell you what that is, so you have to figure out what it means, and it means something different in every place. Um, but they come in, but they don't generally fill in a lot of the details. So World Bank will come in, ADB will come in, uh, and follow in the wake of that. You know, there's always this feeling that you really have the chance to create a holding company, to bring in independent board members, and and all of these other things. Um, you'll also always have people a certain cynicism from incumbents uh, in the country, and also sometimes your fellow staff and where you're working. I've worked in a few different places now. Um, but you'll have that sense of opportunity, but the outcomes are not always the same. Okay? In the wake of, say, the IMF program, I've been in places where you know they put in a law, and then the government, this is another continent, a uh, different continent, uh, the government will uh, break its own law. Right. The SOEs will break their own law. Um, you know, they'll come in, they'll create it. This is uh, Dag knows about the examples. They'll create a holding company, but they don't actually put any companies under it or they don't put any assets under it. Right. So you have this kind of superficial reform in response to a crisis. Um, and, you know, it could be very frustrating. There's one country where many of us in the ADB have worked uh, and they, they've had a big crisis and they've they've done a lot of reforms on paper, but the results have been very very mediocre so you know the real success stories do ultimately come from a serious government commitment to make those reforms and it can happen in very different contexts you know the philippines example it was actually a scandal about board pay specifically they were they were milking the soes they'd get five board seats each these politically connected people and just make all this money and not do anything and it was known the soes were underperforming that kind of gave an opening to a group of people who knew a lot about corporate governance, who knew a lot about reform in other parts of Southeast Asia, and they are able to take advantage of that. Um, one place where we've been working recently in recent years, which also has an interesting electoral uh, culture uh, and is not always called stable, is Papua New Guinea, um, where we had come in with a big program. Um, they were having lots of SV problems. They had a holding company that was underperforming. Um, 
I remember there was the three parts. So it was a, as a multi-year thing. And, you know, after the first part, there was real concern. Is this going to continue? There were elections. Uh, there was all these things happening. There's always things happening in PNG. Um, but they realized they had to fix the SOEs. They realized they could not continue with the status quo. That realization then allowed all these other things to happen in terms of transparency, changing the law, empowering the holding company, and the dividends followed. Just like in the Philippines, in a situation where people did not think it was going to happen, suddenly dividends are being paid again after years of problems. Um, so it's a question of opportunity, but it's really also the government's will to, and the people who are making decisions to push through, to really see these things implemented um, on the ground. It's not just enough to have a new law. It's not just enough to have a new policy. You have to really go out there and start making those changes. But I also think we've seen many cases now where once the momentum get going, gets going, it keeps going. Once the government of the Philippines is getting dividends, they don't want to lose the dividends. You know, we have a lot of success with water companies in the ADB. It's kind of a funny thing. We have many water success stories because I think one of the issues there is once the water is coming out of the taps, you can't turn it off. You can't go back to all the corruption, everything that kept the water from flowing before once this water starts flowing through the taps, but it can be hard to get it flowing through the taps. But once it happens, that success tends to be more sustainable. So I think it is those, this issue of having opportunity, being serious about taking advantage of it, and then trying to ride out the momentum. But once things work, you cannot go back to having things as broken as they were in the past. Um, yeah, so basically, I think each country has its own uh, story on this whole SOE reform process. Uh, so Adrian, I just want to uh, move to you. And uh, so there is no, as, as I think David also put it, there is no one size fits all in terms of how you do uh, SOE reform. Uh, I, I think there's a whole menu of options available to countries in terms of, uh, you know, how they restructure it. So is and I think divestment is probably only one of these options. Uh, how do countries actually decide? How do you come to that uh, to, to, to identify what you know how to determine what to privatize, how to privatize, and when to privatize or when to divest uh, these holdings? Uh, SOE, sorry, uh, and and what uh, other options are available to countries mm. in terms of SOE uh, reform? Okay, and then you know I will I will frame my uh, you know response to this again in terms of our experience in PPP because you know we always deal with you know government on assets and uh, we don't say privatize we monetize some of these assets because too often many of these assets have a high risk premium and and the only way for you to reduce those risk premium and therefore get better value is to you know create governance to create professionalism to to be able to understand what your assets are so it's all of this you know it, it, no one size fits all but I, I think you know the key thing is that you need to you know create accountability you need to create transparency and bring it up for competition you know let let others to, to come in you know for me ppp i think it's it's a good opener uh, because one, these are assets that are often, um, you know, monopoly in nature. And therefore, there is a value to that when the private sector comes in. And that that creates value, that value can then be given back to the government and, and, and of course, address some of the fiscal issues. Um, so, so for me, there's really no one size fits all. But I, I think one thing that we can, we can really, you know, uh, help support, um, you know, our DMC partners is that create some form of accountability deliver this transparency so that then there is an understanding of what they have and offer competition because there's always going to be someone better that can do it. You know, the, the government as, as an operator, as an owner of this asset may not be the, the most efficient operator for this. So therefore allow private parts to come in. Thanks. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, and I, I think you talked a lot about transparency and accountability. So I'm going to t turn to Anne actually and ask you, how do you, what type of, you know, accountability, how do you set up these institutions uh, to ensure the transparency and accountability uh, of, of SOEs, both from, in terms of financial and non-financial activities? Uh, and what steps should be taken to ensure the quality and timeliness of reporting? I think Suresh alluded to this at the meeting, or actually said this in the beginning, uh, that, uh, Though you know private companies who have much 
uh, smaller shareholding are, are, are uh, obligated to to publish their accounts in at in a quarterly or, or annual basis. Uh, the, a lot of these public companies who have 22 million shareholders in Sri Lanka uh, don't really for years they don't publish their accounts. How do you ensure this, or how do you make this happen? But this this is a, a challenge at the moment uh, around the world because both corporate reporting and SOE reporting is under massive change. In uh, Regarding SOEs, you have two levels of reporting, one from the SOE to the holding company, and that's like an annual report or quarterly reporting is preferred um, with an annual report. And, and the, the parameters of that kind of an annual report, as in the commercial sector, is changing massively, particularly to include ESG or environmental, social and governance parameters. But secondly, there is the second level of reporting from the holding company to the government. Now, the best in class expectation, aka like the Tomasics of the world, that an ag aggregate report be presented to the government annually. Now, this should be built on sound data provided to the holding company, um, perhaps um, most likely at a quarterly level, um, building to uh, an annual report, but it should um, be a full and complete report. It should talk about long-term value creation of the portfolio, and it should be able to help inform decision-making by the government and measures the accountability and monitoring that that holding company has done. Now, over the course of time, we expect aggregate reports to explain um, the ownership role and how this is implemented, because that can vary from holding company to holding company. Um, what's the, obviously the total value of the state portfolio and changes in SOE boards and so forth. But I have been privy to seeing the, as, as they're out for consultation, the draft corporate governance state-owned enterprise guidelines. And there is an expectation that there is going to be more in, in aggregate reports on the details of those, the actual operations of those ownership relationships and the linkages with the government and who the people are and how often they talk to one another. And the governance also of subsidiaries of state-owned enterprises and how the holding company manages that side. Um, reporting on joint ventures out of the whole portfolio, if there are such. Um, the, there is an expectation there's going to be required more explicit information on institutional investors at the portfolio level um, in the individual state-owned enterprises. The, um, the institutional investors envisage the sovereign wealth funds or development banks or pension funds who may own shares in each of the individual SOEs. So that what, what ownership they have into uh, the portfolio, the state-owned portfolio. Um, there is also a bit of confusion out there in terms of how the state auditor versus the external auditor of a state-owned enterprise versus the internal auditor of a state-owned enterprise, how they all work together or not, and that the aggregate report is likely to be expected to incorporate more on that. Above all, the aggregate report relies on communication, communication to the government, but not just to the government, on its website, into the media, to the public. The public at large, it's their assets. They need to understand what is happening to their assets. So a higher level of expectation coming for aggregate reporting. In tandem with what's happening in the corporate world, there is expected greater, stronger, better SOE reporting. Yes, um, SOE reporting in uh, the, from the um, reporting from the enterprises has been on a financial level largely but not necessarily um, to comparable international standards. Those SOEs should, would we would like, to be applying international standards, the IFRS, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I would recommend a full take-up of the IFRS and also the international standards on auditing. But the reason I, I, I promote that is because, as it currently stands, most SOEs, do give information to their holding companies, but 
does not always include fully uh, a balance sheet uh, review. And that is important for the holding company and for the government to understand what assets they actually have at their disposal. So I think that's an important factor. But where the uh, developments have really occurred is the expectations from state-owned enterprises on non-financial reporting. What does that involve? Well, it involves inv uh, reporting on the environment, on climate change, on social issues such as labour market reform or labour usage and so on. So there is an increased um, expectation of reporting on non-financial materials. So, uh, but the question is, what standards do you use? Because out there, there's a plethora of standards and they're slowly coalescing, but very slowly. And there's the IFRS, Standard 1 on General um, Non-Financial Disclosures. You could set that as a requirement. Then there's specialist ones like IFRS S2, which is in climate-related disclosures. There are the European standards. There's 13 European standards out there. Um, if you, you could apply those. At the moment, there are so many standards in non-financial reporting um, probably the best practice is to say we expect the following information and tell us which standards you are applying and how you're applying them so that you can actually get more information. But equally on the non-financial reporting, there's an expectation of greater accountability from boards and management on signing off financial and non-financial reports. In other words, both parties should be saying uh, certifying that these are a true and fair position of the company at this point in time. Um, I'm a corporate reporting fanatic, so I won't go on any longer. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So basically, I think uh, to summarize, we need to hold uh, SOEs uh, at, to that high level of standard that we expect from by private companies as well. Uh, and I, I think that's a role of the citizens really uh, uh, to to ensure that that we hold so is to that same high standard uh, i think we we uh, since we are you know uh, high, uh, going out of time uh, we will move on to our q and a segment um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen for the q and a session i would like to invite ms detta back on stage please and uh, also let me remind you please do use our digital form to post your questions for in-person attendees, there is a QR code on your table. And uh, for the virtual participants, the link is already posted uh, on the chat for you to submit your questions. And for your convenience, we are also going to display the QR code on the screen here. And with that, uh, over to you, Dr. Roshan. Thank you. Um, and until we start getting uh, some questions, uh, <coughs> I will start. I will start with you, Dag, on this Q and A segment. Uh, taking off from what you uh, spoke about in terms of valuation of assets, and I think uh, Anne also spoke about it, uh, just a little while ago. Um, you you talked about the undervaluation of a lot of these public assets, uh, but even if governments are able to value them, how can they actually monetize these assets or make them commercially viable? Yeah, um, slightly off pitch, but I, I think if we don't change the whole narrative about SOEs, in that I mean to stop calling them SOEs. If you're going to play a cricket match, a test match against India, and you are recruiting people for that, and, but you don't want to call them cricket players, you're calling them something else. Um, I don't think that they are going to be performing very well. If these are commercial assets, call them commercial assets. As long as you call them SOEs, they are going to feel entitled to perform less well. And the way that they are, should perform and create um, a, a yield is by everybody around them understanding that they are commercial. They can be owned by the private sector or the public sector, it doesn't really, ownership is irrelevant for a commercial assets. When we start treating them equally, that's when we can uh, also um, see that they should produce a yield. So monetization means 
um, both that they are creating a return, a fiscal space, if we're talking government speak. It also means that they should increase their value. Uh, and the purpose of their existence is to increase the value and to produce a yield. The yield can be in two, in two shapes. One is value increase, the other one is dividend. But this is the kind of language that we need to use. We need to stop talking about these commercial assets with government speak. Because as soon as we do that, it's like talking to, using some kind of a treating a child or a cricket player uh, as if they were inferior. If they want to play in the national team, they should be treated as you know, elite or, or professional athletes and professional business people. Thank you. Um, uh, there's another question that has come in on, on this whole concept of the balance sheet for government. Um, so it says that you mentioned that New Zealand basically is one of the only countries that prepares this balance sheet for the country. Uh, so the question is why are countries reluctant to publish it? I don't know whether it's reluctance or the capacity really to, to even prepare these balance sheets. Um, and how can countries really, uh, how can we in Sri Lanka basically uh, go about uh, valuing the assets of the country and, and publish this kind of balance sheet. Yeah, first of all, let, let's let's all agree and let's get at that out of the room. There is no difficulty in valuing public assets. Everything else is just nonsense, um, and, and and we can you know stop that discussion. I, I'm happy to have it if, if if anybody wants to have a technical discussion. But for the sake of this discussion, valuing public assets is only a matter of political will, not of technicalities. Um, and, and the reason that countries don't have this, you could say are, are, <clears throat> are political uh, in one sense and cultural in the other. Political in the sense that many countries, when we have brought this over the last 30 years that I've worked with this, uh, to the board of IMF or other institutions or, or countries, uh, politicians usually uh, refuse because 20 years ago, the, the excuse was, well, we don't want to do this because then our liabilities will be so large. And that triggered me to, to do the first research 20 years ago and write the book, The Public Wealth of Nations, that proved that assets are actually um, substantial for, for every country globally. Um, then the excuse came from some countries that we don't want to show this because uh, if we show how much asset we have, um, our, our people, we wouldn't be able to levy any taxes anymore because they will just require more and more services from the assets that we have. I think the third reason is probably cultural, uh, with the benefit of having recently uh, written a book about uh, public sector accounting together with four other colleagues. One is the architect behind uh, the New Zealand uh, system and, and the uh, architect behind the, the modern public sector accounting, Ian Ball, uh, and, uh, and uh, as well as an historian. And what we found <clears throat> in the discussion coming up uh, leading to this book was that culture in every country, because countries through the 500 years of public sector accounting has existed, uh, accrual accounting. <clears throat> Many countries have actually introduced this and then scrapped it. And for the reason of that there is some kind of politician ruler that felt this is too transparent, I can't do with the money uh, that I f if, uh, what I feel like. <clears throat> uh, Louis XIV, Louis XVI in France, um, <clears throat> in, in the UK, you have the same uh, issues. Um, Holland is probably one of the best examples. And why Holland was successful when the Spanish kingdoms were not in the 1500s and 1600s and 1700s, was probably because they learned very uh, uh, early that in order for to survive in Holland, you were you needed to build uh, dams and 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 dikes <clears throat> to um, keep the 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 um, the ocean the sea out, and this was a communal effort. And then in order to do that, you appropriated land from 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 peasants that required that you actually put up a balance sheet. And, and to see how you can pay for this, how, could, how you can get a yield from this. This created a culture of accounting in Holland that prevails today. 
Mm. So even if they are not as, as good as New Zealand, they still have a culture. And this is why the first stock exchange was created in Holland. And the first limited liability company was created in Holland. Although not to a very good effect to, to, um, to, to this region, but still, if we just see it from a technical perspective and, and without the geopolitics, it is still a, an example which is interesting to understand the dynamism of accounting. Thank you, Doug. Uh, the next question is on retrenchment of staff, and I'm going to uh, pose that to David, because it also talks about the role of <coughs> development partners in this. Uh, so it says that, okay, re so reforms will uh, involve retrenchment of staff, which will affect their livelihoods and incomes. Uh, but of course, retrenchment is a part of a SOE reform process. So in that context, how do we deal with this issue and uh, in an appropriate and manageable way? And what's the role of development partners in this? So this is, this is something DAG knows about, actually, but uh, this is something development partners also have known about for years because accessory reforms have gone on for a long time. So there is, for example, there is a um, World Bank labor restructuring toolkit. There is a ADB labor restructuring publication. Um, we have some people uh, in the ADB who you know have a lot of interest in this issue, what happens to workers in these cases, and we can always tap them as a resource. I, mean, I do think it is important to understand to go into these situations with you can't have the mentality that everybody thinks stays the same for the staff i mean soes typically have too many of the wrong kinds of staff with the wrong kinds of incentives it's a classic problem but you just can't you know just fire them and then just say goodbye either because that that's that's wrong for many reasons um so there's always going to have to be some kind of system whether it's you know, separation packages, creating new employment opportunities, helping them create their own businesses. There's several ways that this is done, um, but this stakeholder component does have to be there. Um, and I think, you know, the development partners certainly, uh, again, while we don't do this all the time, because we don't see enough SOE restructuring, unfortunately, uh, there are people inside the ADB who have an interest in this topic and, and knowledge about it. Um, I would assume that's the case in the World Bank, but you know, always you have to think about your set of stakeholders, uh, which can be mirrored in SRE reform. Like right now, you're also doing uh, reform for creditors. You're doing haircuts, as they sometimes say. You know, People are losing money on the creditor side. There'll be other SOEs. There'll be uh, other stakeholders. Like a classic dilemma when looking at this climate change issues, you, know, you have, say, some coal production or shipping, you're going to reduce that for good reasons, but then it has an impact on the state on railway, right? And then what happens to the state on railway? Because it's now shipping less coal. And then there's some bank, state owned bank, that's let money to the state on railway. Um, so these stakeholder issues are always uh, a big problem for SOE reform, but it's, as you've seen in Sri Lanka, sometimes you have to just push through them, but especially for worker issues, just you should always have a program or some thinking, not just thinking, but actions to take for uh, redundant employees. And as we were discussing yesterday, there's also the flip side of it. For those employees that stay inside the entity, of course, it can mean, including for partial privatizations, for corporatizations, for PPPs, it can mean much more opportunity because now they're inside an entity that has a chance that has a future, right? And has growth prospects. Um, and so it can actually be much better for them. But yes, it should always be a, a top issue and a top consideration in these situations. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, moving to you, Suresh, I think there's a question about, uh, you talked about there being a short window of opportunity uh, for these reforms, particularly with this possible electoral, uh, you know, the upcoming electoral cycle. So in that context, the question asks uh, basically, rushing through this SOE reform process may pose some risks. Uh, for example, the state assets being sold at sort of undervalued, uh, a fraction of their value. Uh, so the question is, should the initial focus be on restructuring and extracting value and divesting later? Uh, and how should this process be managed? So the divestitures are only one part of the whole reform, policy, uh, the whole reform effort. Right. And when I said that we have a short window, I was talking about the entire reform effort. But if I was to just focus only on the divestitures, 
there are no compromises being made where that's concerned. So we are following a particular process. So first and foremost, appointment of uh, good transaction advisors, which was done on a competitive basis, uh, published in both the local and international press. Uh, similar, the transaction advisors are doing a sell side due diligence uh, in addition to valuations and so on and so forth. The, um, we are, will be marketing these entities to uh, parties who we feel will be a good fit uh, from a strategic perspective. Uh, we, will, we are also opening up the process again through uh, both local and internationally published EOIs uh, where anyone interested can uh, submit proposals. Uh, then uh, interested parties again will be given adequate time to do their own due diligence on the buy side. Uh, there will be an RFP process. And so, you know, we follow the right process in the divestiture. Um, so, so, so we are not rushing to sell, notwithstanding the short window. Uh, having said that, in an ideal world, uh, we should have uh, restructured some of these enterprises first, made them profitable, like uh, Dag was alluding to previously. Uh, unfortunately, the country's, uh, the financial situation of the country doesn't allow for that. Um, but so subject to that caveat, the process that we are following uh, is, is a pretty robust, open and uh, transparent process. Uh, one of the first things we did was to get a divestiture guideline approved by cabinet that we'll publish one of, one of these days. It'll be put out into the public. Uh, so people will see how, how the process is. So yes, um, ideally, should have some of these entities should have been restructured before they went into the market. Uh, country's financial position doesn't allow for that. Um, so we are divesting, but we are not rushing through the divestiture. Yeah, no, I, I just, uh, when I hear all these different uh, things, uh, you know, I don't even uh, hardly understand the language, retention and all these, but we're talking about human resources, we're talking about uh, uh, creating a viable and sustainable public commercial portfolio. Uh, my experience uh, doing this, and I learned it the hard way uh, in Sweden 25 years ago and have then applied it, I'm, I'm like a parrot, I repeat the same thing in, in every country, but because it's same, because human beings are the same regardless of where we are. So using, first of all, using SOEs is not a winner. It doesn't go down well in political environment. That's number one. I think I've made that clear. clear. Second thing is using privatizations is, you know, it's an absolutely killer world, word in every culture. Um, and, and same thing, re talking about redundancies, etc. That's not, you know, what we are doing. Uh, I would, the way to succeed with creating a viable and sustainable public commercial portfolio uh, is to have a vision what you want to do, not the negative effects of everything. We are too obsessed in this whole debate with the negative effects for this. And, you know, that no, there's not one politician that has been reelected on the back of privatizations, SOEs, and these kind of narratives. What, how you get reelected, how you get a successful, I'm not a politician, but the way I learned it the hard way because I had a prime minister who was more like a thug, and he, I didn't say he, we, we had a, a fist fight, but it was pretty close to it because he thought I was a hopeless banker from London uh, speaking you know, 30% of my words were not Swedish, they were English. And he just thought I was an absolute uh, uh, abomination in, in the cabinet. So I had to learn to speak proper Swedish and not using English words. And also, every time he asked me for, okay, what am I doing here? I gave him something and it took too long time. He said, oh, I don't have time for this. One sentence, that's all. Give me something nice. So when we're talking about... Uh, that we had to cut staff, he said, no, 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 you can't say that, you know, and, and so we went back and I unfortunately had very good uh, 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 colleagues and this, and we came up with a strap line after three days of thinking and, and beatings by the Prime Minister, suddenly with a strap line, or not suddenly, but finally with a strap line that said, uh, valuable companies create valuable jobs. Okay. 
We don't talk about that we are going to lay off 40% of the post office staff. We're talking about that we are creating a post office that is going to give much more service and it's going to be available 24 seven to everybody in the country and much closer to where you actually are. It's going to be a better post office. We don't talk about all the, um, the, the pain that goes with it. We're talking about the benefits of it. Same thing when we restructure the railways, same thing when we restructure the, the airline, the electricity, the telecom company, we talk about the benefits. What, why are we doing this? The vision, why are we doing this? Then, of course, the, yes, there's going to be some uh, hardships getting this, but having a better airport is going to be better for the tourism industry and for FDIs, for Sri Lanka and for Sweden and w wherever you do this. That's the vision you have to sell. You don't sell the, 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 the pain. And so to marry the political message with whatever technicalities, that is the secret of success. If you don't marry the technicalities, if you only talk about the technicalities, you're going to get one big hit in the head. Clausewitz said it, but I think uh, George Foreman said it much better. You can have a plan, everybody has a plan. It doesn't last until you get hit in the face. And you get hit in the face by politics if you don't marry these two things from the beginning. The narrative has to be there, the vision has to be there. It's the vision to sell, it's not the technicalities. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and, and just as we've been talking about, okay, commercializing these SOEs, uh, but we have to be mindful of the fact that there are certain public service obligations that some SOEs may have to provide, uh, at least in the interim. So the question here is really, how do you ensure provision of state support to SOEs, uh, which are handed down through these uh, social mandates, um, while ensuring that they are financial, financially sustainable? Uh, because sometimes states tend to resort to abruptly stopping the state support to push SOEs to be self-sufficient. Um, so Anne, I'm going to move to you. Uh, would you be would you like to answer that question, please? Yes, indeed. The public service obligations are going to be there uh, it, for, in, in countries like Sri Lanka, as they were in Bhutan. We had an electrification industry, the electrification of the entire part of Bhutan. Now, the way in which the electricity company managed that and DHI managed that was that you had, uh, when you were developing the agreed strate strategy for the next five years, you would say, well, we need to complete the electri electrification of Bhutan. So how do you do that? Well, you have to go back to the government and say, well, what are your expectations? What do you expect this year, next year, the year after? And then you go back to the state-owned enterprise or the, for want of a better name, a commercial company, sure. um, and say, well, how do you expect to fulfill this expectation and what is it likely to cost you? Usually those costs can be either paid out directly by the, the government um, to cover something they wish specifically to be completed, or else it can be a notional transfer um, of lower dividend expectation and so on, but by agreement. In other words, you need to specify very clearly what is the obligation, what is the expectation of the obligation, who's going to do it and by when, and how much is it going to cost. Now, there will always be these that need to be negotiated, and it should come at the beginning of every year where you have a confirmation of the strategy going forward and the budgets going forward. Thank you, Anne, for that. Um, I'm going to move on to Christine because this is on the holding company, but it's more to do with capacity building. Uh, so while the, the question says, while the holding company is a positive recommendation, uh, I, I think we've got to kind of answered this part of the question. What are the lessons learned from setting these up uh, where it doesn't succeed? But I think the uh, question that maybe you'd uh, like to answer is, how do you create a level of long-term independence and capability that will be in direct competition with short-term political, uh, political interests and still be able to resist that pressure? Also, is there a mechanism where the citizens or the private sector can engage with these kind of holding companies? Christina, are you there? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. 
Um, I think probably the primary the primary factor would be in the um would be talent and capacity building as as um, some have some of the panelists have mentioned earlier and in the case of Tamasic, you would see that first and foremost in the composition of our board so our board is um we have we have 11 members currently and a majority of them are independent private sector directors all of them with diverse skill sets. And in fact, the Singapore government does not have any nominees on our board. And equally, for our portfolio companies, we have independent boards, which um, are uh, uh, which which all contribute to, which are all able to contribute towards guiding the business of the portfolio companies. So I think that's um that's one of the most critical factors in terms of ensuring the success of the um holding company as well as its downstream portfolio companies. And then equally, I think it could be the um, compensation um, framework. So in the case of Tamasic, our compensation framework and ethos is to place the institution above the individual. And we emphasize long-term over short-term so as to align employee and shareholder interests over economic cycles. And so we have a situation where Returns above our overall risk-adjusted cost of capital determines our wealth-added incentive pool, and negative portfolio returns, in fact, determine a clawback pool. And we have deferred incentives and clawbacks that are integral to our remuneration. I think I think those are the two of the most important factors that I can think of. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Roshan, can I also yes. just uh, take that question? Uh, so a couple of things. Um, let me start with the SOEs themselves before I come to the holding company. So uh, in the SOEs and also in the holding company, the articles of association of both, uh, both types of entities, uh, we want to put in director profiles, board profiles. Okay. Um, then from the SOE perspective, the SOEs like any listed company uh, will have the different board committees, including a nominations committee. So the whenever there is a board vacancy, the nominating committee will have the responsibility to make a recommendation on the, on the appointment to fill that vacancy based on the board profiles that are given in the articles of association, right? The role of the holding company in that process is to just give a yes or a no. Uh, so, and in doing that, they got, to follow, they got to see whether the process has been followed, whether the right process has been followed, whether the profile fits, right? Uh, they don't make recommendations in terms of uh, telling the SOE, here is someone, please appoint them to the board. That's, that's not what the holding company does. When it comes to the holding company, we've also built in a mechanism into the articles of the holding company, which, which tries to create a kind of a Chinese wall between political interference and the appointment of board members. Uh, so through, so, you know, fundamentally, we are, uh, you know, Christine, in, spoke about the political will. We are going on the basis that the political will in this country is not where it should be, right? So we are trying to build in certain mechanisms uh, to make sure that these appointments are professionally made irrespective of what the political will is. So that's, that's the route that we are following. Whether we'll succeed or not is a different story, but that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so following up from that there's another question actually on this whole thing of election cycles and making sure that these SOE reforms go beyond the election cycle so I think it's about building consensus across political parties uh, so how can that be done and what pros I mean what has been done up to now to build this kind of consensus within the country yeah so I've have I've had conversations with the different political parties with the different politicians some uh, some who see things the way that uh, we would see it, uh, some uh, who would see it very differently. But we've started the process of conversation and I'm, uh, I'm very optimistic that through this conversation process, we are also planting seeds. Uh, you know, people come, sometimes I've noticed people come to the table with very different ideas. Um, and then, you know, through the conversation, yes, we, we change our minds as well, but at the same time, we've seen 
uh, even they start to think differently, that there are, you know, different options that are available and probably better options as well, right? Uh, I'm really disappointed that one major political party, the leader of it has still not seen us, although I made numerous requests to see, to go and visit him and explain what we are doing. Um, but other than that, I, I must say that the response that we have had uh, from some of the other political parties is very positive. Um, uh, yeah, let me stop at that. I don't want to get into too much detail on this. Thank you, Suresh, for that. Um, yeah, so, so this is a question on uh, basically on uh, how, um, how uh, SOE reforms have previously monopolized sectors in the private sector and, and uh, sort of inhibited competition. Um, so I, I think that's a, a good question of uh, how can we set up this regulatory framework? I mean, I, I think divestment um, is only, you know, has is something that happens down the road. Before that, there is a whole process that needs to be followed uh, to ensure that there is this competitive uh, uh, competition uh, framework in place before you can divest some of these institutions. Uh, how has that worked in other countries and what lessons can we learn from them? So it's, a, it's an old lesson of privatization. Uh, when the wave of privatization started in the 1980s, they would privatize an electricity company without fully creating the way of setting uh, electricity prices. Um, and electricity prices would suddenly become very high uh, after it was privatized. Um, so that's, that's an old lesson. I mean, uh, and this is one of the things that causes a lot of um, people getting upset around privatization. Or if you continue to have the SOEs, um, you make some reforms, you nominally open up to the private sector, but you still have a lot of SOEs, and the SOEs have access to, you know, government contracts, uh, lending from state-owned state -owned banks at concessionary rates, lending from you know, World Bank from concessionary rates, rates. You have the other situation where you've nominally reformed or opened up to competition, but the SOEs always have the advantage. Um, you have an unlevel playing field. Uh, fortunately, the sort of commercial reforms we've been talking about all day kind of each push in the same direction in terms of, you know, if, if the government and the SOEs are, are motivated to be more efficient, to be not to be SOEs, but to be commercial, um, they themselves will see opportunities really to contract out, use either PPPs formally or work with the private sector informally, and maybe with some additional pushing from the government to sell off some parts that can be sold. Um, that is one way to bring in the private sector. I mean, I know examples um, I'll, I'll give, I have it named countries, I'll name uh, Maldives, so not far from here. Um, you know, they have one state trading organization that was created to bring in vital commodities. They decided that bringing in vital commodities meant that they need to own most of the local retail in <laughs> the Maldives, um, right? So you have a situation there where they would like to continue doing that, so the government may, may need to push them to sell off some of that to bring in the private sector. But I think it's it's these two parts of kind of, or three parts, of if you are gonna sell the electricity company or something, you have to have a tariff setting mechanism and a regulatory authority in place. Um, where if it's, if it's not a monopoly, whether it's through positive incentives or some pushing, you need to have them bring in the private sector where it's, it's, it's straightforward to do that and then the commercialization process should also create the level playing field because you've pulled away the blanket subsidies, you've pulled away the easy state credit, um, you're making them work more like commercial firms, earning returns on capital, positive returns on capital, and then that also creates space for the private sector. But all these reforms, you know, and they're all being looked at, I think uh, here and in other places where we've worked, they all fit together quite naturally in creating uh, space for the, the private sector and creating space for competition. Thank you, David. Um, and moving from that, I'd like to actually ask a question on, uh, you know, because there are a lot of SOEs that might continue to uh, be with the, with the state, at least initially. So how does the state, and I'll ask you, Suresh, and maybe others can also chip in, how does the state separate its role uh, of, the, of an operator versus a regulator? Because in many of these, sectors they are in both uh, 
uh, because again, this whole thing of the level playing field, how do they ensure a level playing field by this separation of role? So um, ideally, uh, Roshan, and this is again a recommendation that we've made, um, you know, first and foremost, as many commercial enterprises as possible need to be put into private hands. Um, so if there is a entity that uh, access both a commercial entity as well as a regulate, and there are some uh, examples of this, uh, you know, the, the first, the preferred route might be to divest the commercial part of it leave and leave the regulatory part of it within government. But if for whatever reason you can't do that, because uh, you know you may create a monopoly situation market failure whatever um, still you need to take the regulatory role out of the enterprise and split the two up from uh, you know you need to create a separate regulator a separate commercial entity and ideally have those two under two separate ministries uh, so one of the recommendations we've also made is that all commercial enterprises should come under the ministry of finance uh, not go under a line ministry um, so the regulatory function can then go under the line ministry because it's also the policy making entity uh, or you have a different mechanism but at at in a verse not well the, the the minimum to be done is to separate the two the regulatory function from the commercial function and have it under two separate ministries thank you okay. yes go ahead uh, i mean all, all the questions that you've had so far <clears throat> i mean really speaks to the idea or, or, or the narrative that this is a communicating vessel. It doesn't matter what you do if you ownership doesn't really shouldn't really matter. Uh, the regulation you know, is absolutely paramount. Subsidies, everything. There is millions of ways. Every country I work in, I find new ways of siphoning money out to the private sector. You can sell an asset too cheaply. You can have commercial loans from one of the state-owned banks. You can have subsidies, etc. All this, there are millions of ways of, you can call it corruption, or just uh, enriching the private sector or, or individuals, etc. There is no faster way in any country in the world, including what you think are, you know, impeccable places like Sweden, etc. But, but it, it, you know, they don't exist. Because these are communicating vessels. If you have commercial state-owned commercial banks, they will rather allocate money to the state um, to, to the public sector um, assets, and and this is a wasteful way of capital allocation, and and takes away money from the private sector. If you have a monopoly, that takes away competition and efficiency in that sector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it's not a, the whole purpose of this is not to privatize or not to you know wh whatever we are talking about all the technicalities here it's about creating transparency so that people can actually see where are my money going where is the public sector money going if we are if we need to subsidize something it should be transparent and paid by tax money from the budget in a in a separate it shouldn't go through an soe because as soon as a subsidy goes through an soe there will be corruption, inefficiencies, and waste. As soon as you have a state-owned commercial bank, they will allocate money to state commercial assets, and that will be waste. So it's by you know, clear separation and having a holding company that has IFRS accounting with no subsidies whatsoever, and all subsidies outsourced to a separate entity. Uh, that's the only way that we are going to get efficient capital allocation productivity and where we can measure what is the yield of a state uh, holding company for commercial assets what is the cost of uh, subsidies in society if you mix them with commercial assets there is no way we can understand it if you have commercial uh, banks there is no way we can understand where the money how the money is used etc so the, the the whole purpose of this and this is what you what you can sell politically you don't sell privatizations you don't sell restructurings you don't sell anything like that's not sellable in a political context what you sell is your you are going to get the private sector is going to get more money in from from in the financial side people are going to get more money there's going to be more investment because it's going to be visible thank you uh, and in the last few minutes i'll just get each one to maybe in a minute, 
uh, give some last words of advice to Sri Lanka on our on the restructuring process. And maybe I'll start with Adrian. Yeah, thank you. Uh, look, I, I think, um, you know, it's an interesting time for Sri Lanka. And I think, uh, you know, there are options to take. But I think what we're hearing from this panel today is that you need to have a strong governance. You know, you need to have transparency. You need to have the clarity in terms of what you want to achieve. Uh, because at the end of the day, I think what we're trying to push here is, is really pushing for everyone, for the nation. So therefore, I think things getting it right. Uh, and, and, and have some form of a rule of law that will allow, you know, individual uh, parties, uh, you know, to, to be on equal playing field uh, with focus, of course, on benefiting the, the public. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anne? Uh, yes, I'd just like to reiterate that I think the vision is absolutely there. The vision is critical. But next thing is the leadership, leadership at the holding, um, holding company level and of the state-owned enterprises. That leadership needs to be very committed and um, and well organized in introducing commercial practices of governance, of reporting, of um, organization, of management, and so on. Thank you, Christine. I think um, Sri Lanka seems to have done a lot of work on the reform, and they sound to me like they have the the right um, mechanisms and the right um, legal provisions in place. And I wish them all the best in their journey towards reform. Thank you, Christina. Uh, David? Just to follow up on Christina, just keep going. I've heard a lot of good things the last few days. I think Dag and I came in, you know, somewhat concerned from all the things we'd seen in the press and the outside coverage and what we'd heard about the IMF program. But what I'm seeing here, you're, you're definitely in the right direction. You just have to persevere. I would say that is the key to persevere with these reforms and implement them. Thank you. And Doug? Well, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, I think we've been talking to, to, to officials here, and it's, I think the focus is focus on these numbers that we've been talking about. The, just like Temasek is doing, you have 120 billion US dollars of public commercial assets. Focus on growing that value so that it is to the benefit of society as a, as a whole and generating that three billion or four billion out of that portfolio that is the focus to the benefit of society as a whole mm. thank you the last word for you suresh <laughs> Thank you, Roshan. Uh, you know, when I come to conferences of this nature, talk to consultants, etc., it's all about the technical stuff, right? And uh, you know, on the technical stuff, we know we know a bit. Uh, plus, also there there are so so many examples globally that we can pick from, right? There are institutions like the ADB that we can go to, the World Bank that we can go to. So the technical stuff is not the issue. The issue is political will like Christina said upfront, right? I mean, Singapore is Singapore because of the political will. And Sri Lanka is Sri Lanka because of a lack of it. So now if we don't want to go back for the 18th IMF program five years down the road, you know, we've been there almost once in five years, uh, 17 times over 75 years, right? If you don't want to go back for our 18th IMF program, we need to have the political will to transform the country uh, to do things differently than what we've done in the past. Uh, our politicians are not going to do that. So that has to come from the citizens. And unless we as citizens, whether we are just, you know, individuals, whether we are the private sector, whether we are other types of organizations and institutions, I think we need to push back on our politicians and say, look, the time to change has come. We need to change. We need to transform and we need to get that done. So I think there is a lot of responsibility on us as citizens, uh, not just on the SOE reforms, but reforms in general. Um, so that's my message. We need the political will, and that's going to come only if we as citizens insist on it. No pressure on you, Suresh. <laughs> Three billion from you instead of the IMF. <laughs> I think this is good. good point to uh, end on, and I don't think I can put it any better or summarize it any better. So just let me end by thanking all the panelists uh, for their contributions. It has been a very uh, interesting and uh, enlightening discussion, and also the uh, audience, both here uh, 
present uh, at, uh, at this location, but also those who have joined us virtually. Thank you very much for your active part participation. And now I'll hand over to Nick. Once again, thank you everyone for that insightful uh, and very uh, interesting conversation on uh, SOE reforms in Sri Lanka and also lessons learned from other countries. So with that, we come to the end of today's uh, proceedings. And let me invite, uh, kindly invite uh, Mr. Anuradha Kumarasri, Editor General of National Planning Department, to present the closing remarks on behalf of Sri Lankan government. Uh, good morning still, I think we have very few minutes. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, ADB, uh, organizing this uh, jointly with the NPD, uh, seventh uh, serendipity knowledge program. Uh, we started this event or the, the similar events uh, since uh, 2021. Uh, I'm happy to be here, uh, even the seventh event as a closing remarks and uh, opportunity given to me by the uh, ADB. And uh, of course, this uh, discussion, I think this year, this time uh, we have taken a little uh, longer time than the previous events. And uh, previously we given only two hours uh, discussion, but today because of the, the importance of the event, uh, we have decided to take at least uh, three hours almost this discussion, I think everyone will agree uh, what we have discussed so far. Uh, eminent panelists, and also, of course, start with the, the Treasury Secretary, ST, uh, Mr. Sirivardhana, and of course, uh, the DG uh, South Asia Division, uh, Mr. Kenichi Yokohama. Always, he's always uh, giving uh, opening remarks with, uh, for the forum starting. And I have to thank all uh, uh, speakers, panelists, uh, especially I have to thank ADB, get down the uh, deck data, who has a lot of experience uh, to, uh, all over the world and uh, 30 years experience uh, reforming the stories uh, all over the world. And of course he has worked uh, with all uh, eminent uh, agencies, IMF, World Bank, or with ADB also. And uh, uh, today's uh, discussion, I think, uh, uh, I am very much uh, thank uh, Suresha. He end up with the, this closing remarks. That is the most uh, important uh, idea. What I what I feel, and uh, as a citizen of Sri Lanka, we, we have a lot of responsibility. Uh, not only SOE reforms, of course. At the moment, government is doing a lot of reforms. Uh, SOE reform is one of them, and uh, citizen, uh, we have to push every corner. Uh, this is the time to do. Uh, and uh, with the economic crisis, uh, uh, I think uh, yesterday we had a discussion with uh, that uh, data in my office. Uh, he said uh, he asked a lot of questions. Uh, I, I I was not able to answer the correct answer. Uh, but I don't want to highlight why, what are the answers and why I have not answered well. But uh, his views are very much different than the others. Uh, therefore, I think I asked him to meet uh, very important uh, people and give your thought, your views. Uh, but of course, he has given us this opportunity, uh, taking uh, time, uh, sharing his experience. And also all the other panelists, uh, from the various uh, corners in in the world world bank singapore and adb uh, we have to thank everyone who has shared with us their experience knowledge uh, in this session i think uh, the key points i think uh, reform might uh, not easy as we has experienced uh, recent past uh, the uh, the electricity prices gone up, water prices gone up, other prices also gone up, but now government has managed uh, somewhat uh, the uh, inflation. Uh, therefore, I think, uh, of course, crisis is not over. Uh, it will take uh, 
a few years to come down uh, to the normal situation. Therefore, our, as a citizen, we have a more responsibility as a government officer, we have a more responsibility uh, to implement. And also we, we have been talking about the good governance throughout. Uh, the governance is very important uh, when we are doing all the reforms. And also the government has also responsibility to uh, make system in place. And also we have to identify the right person and right uh, to put into the right place. Otherwise, you, you can't do any reform or you can't implement any activity or any development activities in Sri Lanka. Therefore, I think uh, we, we are the citizen has all the responsibility, not the politician. Of course, we have to direct the politician uh, and also uh, direct all the, the experts who are in the country. Uh, and this uh, seventh event, uh, Knowledge Serendipity, uh, we, we choose, we decided the timely these SOE reforms, uh, challenges and opportunities. Yes, challenges are there, but opportunity we have to create. We have to uh, uh, do our everything to get the opportunity uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I think uh, uh, my colleague, uh, our ADB uh, country director, uh, will give more elaboration on the, the speeches. But in general, uh, I have to thank especially ADB, uh, who has supported uh, throughout for the knowledge and deputy event and uh, also providing a uh, lot of uh, technical support to sri lanka and to the government and uh, we will meet in the the eighth event very soon and thank you very much but i have to say one one uh, very important uh, uh, idea the the previous uh, country director adb chenchen the last meeting we we met he just asked me to continue with the ADP this serendipity event, uh, at least a few women uh, to be conducted in future. That's what his last uh, word. And I think I have to thank uh, uh, new country director taking that leadership and having consultation, discussion, and opportunities to share the worldwide experience to us and also giving opportunity to have a consultation. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kumarasiri. Uh, to present the closing remarks on behalf of ADB, I invite Mr. Takafumi Kaduno, Country Director of Sri Lanka Resident Mission of ADB. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, uh, DG Kumarasiri. Thank you for your kind words. Um, very exciting, very exciting session. This is my first um, uh, event uh, organized by ADB as a country director. Very informative, uh, eye-opening, inspiring. I was told that there are 80 participants uh, in the room and uh, 130 plus uh, joining virtually, so it clearly demonstrates the, the interest that uh, you all have on this topic on uh, SOE uh, reforms. Um, I hope you found this uh, session this morning as exciting as, uh, as I have. Um, obviously, reforms to improve SOE performance uh, and reduce their losses, liabilities are, are clearly critical for Sri Lanka's uh, recovery and uh, sustained growth. It was, of course, heartening to see the government's ongoing uh, commitment to reform and to hear their ambitious plans going forward as presented by the, the Secretary to the Treasury. And I appreciate uh, the lessons, tales of caution, and positive messages uh, shared by Dag and the panelists. Of course, um, <laughs> DG, uh, I, I won't try to summarize uh, all the discussions, but uh, a few takeaways, um, not just for this audience here, but as a, as a message to the world, I guess. A uh, clear theme from our speaker is the need to have uh, for real reforms to enable SOEs to be much more commercial and professional. I think the word professional came up many times. Uh, here in Sri Lanka, the first step uh, establishing the SOE uh, restructuring unit under the leadership of uh, Suresh, and no pressure on you, uh, and but I wish you all the best. Uh, the government is also introducing uh, new legal and regulatory frameworks, including SOE policy, SOE Act, and uh, looking to establish a SOE holding company. So these are bold steps being taken. 
I think Doug had uh, several important and uh, uplifting points, such as uh, SOE reform as not as a, a policy tool, but a fiscal tool, the need to have data on public commercial assets, including real estate, understanding their values, and knowing the potential of uh, how much yield that such commercial assets can produce uh, if managed commercially and professionally. Uh, the importance of creating an institution like a holding company to, pr to protect and professionally manage those assets under strong professional governance and oversight. And they need to look, feel, and smell like private sector. Um, I guess if all is done well, uh, these public commercial assets can generate substantial resources uh, for the government to address other priorities for the prosperity of the country and its citizens. Uh, enjoy listening to uh, uh, Christina from Tamasek as well. I, I live many years in uh, Singapore, so it's like my second home. Um, it's a, it's a, one of the, the successful um, example of SOE holding company. Um, and uh, it was uh, interesting to see that um, they are making a 14% ROE. Uh, from the panelists, important points to keep in mind, uh, segregating policy from professional management of public commercial assets, the need for political will and political stability, which is essential, uh, SOE transparency, including the importance uh, of implementation of internationally accepted accounting and auditing standards, and disclosure of uh, SOE liabilities to the public and with state banks, etc. And of course, the need to have professional oversight, not only at uh, the holding uh, ownership level, but also at the individual SOE level with board members and managers with private sector backgrounds, understanding corporate governance. I think I read in a, a memoir by Lee Kuan Yew once when he visited Sri Lanka, he mentioned uh, something about Sri Lankan airlines saying, um, how can a airline pilot manage uh, an airline? Um, so I, I guess the, the leadership, which was uh, mentioned by the panelists, and uh, the need for strong corporate governance are very important. And then uh, what came out at the end was um, the importance of vision over the technicality, as uh, many of the panelists mentioned. And in relation to that, I would also add that stakeholder consultation and communication are important in this process, and to convey that what the benefits are to the society uh, when we do this. And as we, go, as we undergo our own reforms in ADB, um, we will be providing a fresh support to Sri Lanka's SOE reform. Um, currently, we are already working uh, or supporting the government-led uh, power sector reform, which involves the, the restructuring the Salon Electricity Board. Uh, but going further, um, and, and um, prompted by this session, uh, I hope we can uh, partner with the government and all stakeholders to support more broad uh, reforms in the area of uh, state-owned enterprises and beyond. And of course, this will be done in a close collaboration with IMF, World Bank, and other development partners, and with uh, passionate experts like DAG, uh, and as part of our wider support to Sri Lanka's recovery and strong, sustainable, inclusive growth. With that, I know it's lunchtime, so I thank you all for participating in this uh, serendipity uh, knowledge event on uh, state-owned enterprise reform, reforms. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all in the, the eighth one. Okay, DG, okay, um, uh, in the near future. Thank you again, and uh, there is, I think, that, that's your job, right? Okay, so thank you so much. <laughs>